सकते हैं Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday, July 27, 2010 edition on Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. I'm your host, Christian Walters. Welcome to NTT as New Trust Technology. And we'll do the disclaimer next. Take notice and acknowledgement with agreement that this show and our documents is private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or implored for making a legal decision. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and or documents are for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents therein, you understand with agreement that, with all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in the preparation or use of herein reference, and has no interest in any use referenced therein, and is not a party to this or any action arising from, and is only acting in an authorized capacity as liaisons to communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and our show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached herein by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for admiralty commercial damages of $100 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walters' discretion. Thank you for your understanding. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Tuesday, July 27th edition of Money Banking and Trust. Welcome to NTT. Uh, we're going over Book 90 in Corpus Juris Secundum, and uh, we left off at a section, but I think we're going to switch gears here a little bit. Uh, we're going to go to page 820 under Section 7. We're going to talk about the establishment and enforcement of trust. Establishment and enforcement of trust. So we're going to key in on the, the enforcement here. So it's A, rights of city key trust against trustee. And beginning on section 421. Section 421 on page 820. Section 421, establishment of existence of trust. Or necessary for the protection of the rights or interests of the city key trust, equity will come to his aid by establishing and enforcing the trust. Now let that soak in a little bit. Were the necessary for the protection of the rights, the rights, or the interests, rights and interests of the city key trust, either under an express trust or in his favor, or under an applied trust, equity will come to his aid by establishing and enforcing the trust. In the absence of any equitable reason why that should not be done, a bill in equity will not lie, however, for the sole purpose of declaring a trust. So a bill in equity will not lie we could jump to a section and right. And let's go to uh, section 422. And then at the end of 422, 
under the action at law, it says the equitable right of a beneficiary of a trust may not be enforced by an action at law against the trustee. An action at law will lie. Let me read that again. An action at law will lie. Now we're going to go back to where we just picked up reading, and we're going to read that first part under 421 again. A bill in equity now will not lie. You want to play in liar's court? Play in the at-law side. You want to be in truth? You play in equity. Continue on. A bill in equity will not lie, however, for the sole purpose of declaring a trust without enforcing it, even though the defendant denies its existence. Although a trust may be declared and the bill retained for further direction where the circumstances make such procedure proper, and where the question whether an implied trust has arisen out of the particular transfer or transaction can be determined by only the subsequent events. Subsequent events. Better have those elements and uh, method of formation as the subsequent events. Continuing on, a suit for the establishment or enforcement of the trust will not lie pending such determination. The power of an equity court is limited to the establishment and enforcement of trusts and does not extend to their creation. Thus, equity cannot be invoked to perfect an imperfect gift by creating a trust where the words employed are insufficient in themselves to have such effect. Although the assertion of and failure to establish a gift do not prevent a party from procuring the enforcement of a valid trust arising out of other circumstances. Next section has dependent on existence of equitable grounds. Equitable grounds. Your grounds better be equitable. A trust may be established and enforced only on the grounds of equity. A trust may be enforced only on the grounds of equity and good conscience, and in the absence of an express trust, a sufficient contract, or other strong equitable circumstances requiring the intervention of a court of equity, a trust will not be impressed. No trust will be established or enforced where it should be inequitable to do so. Courts of equity do not enforce or impose penalties or punish persons for their wrongs in the administration of trust, but only furnish the adequate means of redress when the law fails to do so. When the at-law size fails, your remedy or your relief is in equity. Next section, 422, enforcing execution or performance of duties of trust. Where the trust has been declared or established or the trustee has accepted the trust, equity, as long as it is possible for it to do so, will not permit the trustee to defeat the trust by his wrongful acts or failure or refusal to act, but it will enforce the execution or performance of the trust. Equity will not compel a trustee to take on himself the burdens of a trust, but where the trust has been declared or established, or the trustee has accepted the trust, equity, as long as it's possible to do so, will not permit the trustee to defeat the trust by his wrongful acts, or failure or refusal to act, but will enforce relief by compelling the faithful execution of the trust for the preservation and enforcement of rights. Depending on and derivative from it, and even though the directions contained in the instrument creating the trust may seem to be fanciful or unwise, prove the person seeking the execution of the trust complies with any conditions present imposed by the instrument. Thus, a court of equity may, in proper case, compel a trustee to make payments to the beneficiaries, to apply trust funds property to the purposes for which the trust was created, to refund money misappropriated, to transfer or convey the trust property, and properly execute a deed therefore, or 
made a sale of the trust property according to the terms of the trust and may be compelled the execution of the powers in a trust. Similarly, relief may be afforded in equity against a trustee who attempts to hold the property, attempts to hold the property, attempts to hold the property and disclaim the trust. And we went over a letter last night, one of the first calls on the Q&A, and he was complaining of that. They, they, hey, they sent a letter, and they didn't want to give the trust res property back. They didn't include it along. And then they disclaimed and said, hey, you know, we don't, we don't agree with all this, and we're not going to do it. Now, what's that say here? Similarly, relief will be afforded in equity against a trustee who attempts to hold the property and disclaim the trust. Isn't that what was going on there? or who refuses to take proper steps for the protection of the trust property against adverse claims. Continuing on, equity will not, however, force a trustee to do an act in, with respect to the trust property, which cannot do without violating the directions of the instrument creating the trust and subjecting himself to liability, nor will it compel him to assume additional burdens not provided for by the trust itself, unless imposed by law. The court may construe an instrument creating or declaring a trust and, if necessary, reform it to conform to the settler's intentions, but only the trust actually created may be enforced and not such a trust as might or should have been created. Action at law, which we read. Equitable right of a beneficiary of a trust may not be enforced by an action at law against the trustee. An action at law will lie. However, against a trustee in favor of a city key trust to recover money due and payable to the city key from the trust estate where the amount of it is certain. Next section, 423. Setting aside wrongful acts of trustee. A city key trustee or trust may, in a proper case, invoke the aid of a court of equity to have wrongful acts of the trustee affecting the trust property set aside. Affecting the trust property to set aside. Hmm. Setting aside wrongful acts of trustees. Wow. Pretty powerful there. A city key trust may invoke the aid of a court of equity to have wrongful acts of a trustee affecting the trust property set aside. Whether or not such acts constitute actual fraud or result in loss to the city, such as cancel a lease, made by a trustee in payment of a private debt to the leasee to set aside a conveyance of property disposed of in contrary to the terms of the trust or to cancel a deed of trust made on a trust property by the trustee without authority to secure a loan to him individually, the city keys or the sestuis right to relief in the latter case not being subject to any requirement he, that he may, that he refuse, ref, excuse me, that he refund the amount of the loan to the grantee under the deed of trust. An unauthorized or wrongful transaction must, however, be set aside as a whole, if at all, and the SETUI cannot disaffirm it as a trustee and at the same time affirm it as to the person to whom the trustee has dealt. Next, personal assets. It has been held that any transaction by a trustee involving his own personal assets is at least voidable by the beneficiary. Next section, 424, reimbursement of advances and expenditures made by city key trust. A city key trust is entitled to reimbursements out of the trust fund or property for advances and expenditures made at the request of the trustee or in which it was, un which was necessary for him to make by reason of the trustee's failure or neglect to act. A city key trust is entitled to reimbursement out of the trust fund or property for advances and expenditures which he has made at trustee's request for the purpose of preserving such property or fund, or which it was necessary for him to make by reason of the trustee's failure or neglect to act, and is entitled to the prior lien on a trust property for sums necessarily expended by him for its protection. He is not, however, entitled to reimbursement for advances and expenditures, which he has voluntarily made without any request or default on the part of the trustee. Section 425 lien on property of trustee and lien the property of the trustee up here. The city key trust has no lien on property or estate of a trustee for the amount of any personal liability 
While a trustee may be personally liable to his city key trust for sums due to the latter out of the trust fund, or for a loss of trust funds or property caused by the trustee's violation of a trust as considered supra section 253, the city key has no lien on private property or estate of the trustee for the amount which the such personal liability, except that where trust funds or property is by the trustee mingled with or invested in his own property, the city the sestui may have a lien, therefore, on common property as discussed in for section 437 through 439. Next section, 426, creditors of trustee engaged in business. Where a trustee has charge of a trust estate engaged in business with implied power to contract debts with its management, the trust estate is primarily liable for debts contracted on the faith of it, and the trustee is trustee for all the debt creditors as well as for the city key trust. Where a trustee has charge of trust estate engaged in business with implied power to contract debts in its management, the trust estate is primarily liable for debts contracted on the faith of it, and the trustee is trustee for all the creditors as well as the city key trust. On the trust estate and the trustee as such becoming insolvent, he is bound to protect all the rights of creditors and preserve the estate for distribution among them according to rights and he has no right by executing judgment notes or otherwise to give a preferable to any uh, preferable to any of the creditors judgment notes or otherwise I wonder what those really are judgments out of a court number section 427 insolvency of trustee where a trustee has an interest in the trust property, his insolvency does not entitle the city key trust to demand that the property be turned over to him. Where a trustee is an, has an interest in the trust property, his insolvency does not entitle the city key trust to determine that the property be turned over to him. The effect of insolvency on the right to uh, follow the trust property or the proceeds thereof is discussed in for a section 440. Next section, 428 priorities of set of key trust and trustees creditors in general in the absence of a statute to the contrary and where he has not waived his rights or stopped himself to claim them the rights of the city key trust and the trust fund or property in the hands of the trustee or his representatives or assign e originally are superior to the claims of general creditors of the trustee in his personal capacity the rights of a city key trust and the trust fund or property in the hands of a trustee or his representative or signee ordinary, ordinarily are superior to the claims of general creditors of a trustee in his personal capacity, provided the SETI is not waived to his rights or has stopped himself to claim them, as discussed in for section 429. And unless otherwise provided by statute, this rule applies even though the trustee's creditors extend credit to him on the strength of his apparent ownership, except as against a creditor who is misled or defrauded by reason of the trust being kept secret by one by voluntary act of the city key trust. The claim of the sestui will not prevail, however, as against the claims of creditors of the trust estate, unless such creditors have to stop themselves to assert their priority as considered infra, section 429, but such creditors cannot, by delaying the collection of their claims, postpone the assertion by the city of the rights of the trust property or funds, particularly where the trust estate is fully solvent next personal state or personal assets it has been held that the trustee's wrongful failure to assert a right held in trust gives the beneficiary no lien prior to other creditors on the trustee's general assets not belonging to the trust b judgment and attachment creditors the general rule that the rights of the set of key trust and the trust funds in the trust funds or property are ordinarily superior to those creditors of the trustee has been held to be applicable with respect to the judgment or attachment creditor. That the rights of the city key trust in the trust fund or property are ordinarily superior to the creditors of the trustee is applicable with respect to a judgment or attachment, uh, attachment creditor, and particularly so as to such creditor of a trustee under an applied trust where the trustee has always treated the fund or property as held in trust or where the debt exists at the time the trust arose. Next section, where trustee has beneficial interest in the trust property or part thereof, his creditors levying on the property can acquire only trustee's rights or interest therein, and the creditor will not be permitted 
to reach even the trustee's interest in the property by levy and sale, and that such interest is not capable of separation and the sale of the property would defeat the trust in favor of other beneficiaries. Now think about the title, really. Coming against the title on the beneficiary, what title is the beneficiary, or excuse me, the title on the trustee if they're coming after the property held in trust? What title does the trustee hold? Because that's the only title that they can get. But ask yourself, who is the real owner of the trust? And what title does that person hold? So the trustee holds legal title, and that's the only thing the creditors could really take. But who's the real owner of the real legal title? The beneficiary. If you think about it, the at-law side cannot touch the land. The land held in trust. The lien is only against the property or the building on the land, not the land itself. Continuing on, Section 429, Estoppel or Waiver. A city key trust or one claiming to be who is competent to act for himself may be estopped or waive his right to enforce a trust in favor by words or on his part, which expressly or impl by implication show an intention to abandon or not to rely on or assert such trust. Boy, I could tear that up, use that up in a court case right there. Anybody that sent me a letter, hey, wouldn't that be such that they're, by their words or their acts, on a part which expressly or implied show an intention to abandon or not rely on the assert or the assert the trust? Sounds like a failure of duty. Continuing on, the settler's trustee, vendee, or creditors of a trust estate may, in proper case, be estopped or held to waive their rights. Waive their rights. Hope you're taking notes tonight, folks. The city key trust, the one claiming to be, who is competent to act for himself, may be estopped. May be estopped. Or waive his right. Or waive his right to enforce a trust in his favor by words or acts. On his part, which, you know, your actions speak louder than your words. You'll, you will act right over top of your indenture. Or they can act right over top of their debtor-creditor contracts and waive their rights. Continuing on, or acts on parts which expressly are implied by implication, show an intention to abandon or not rely on or assert such trust as by acquiescing with knowledge of all the material facts and the alleged trustees act in dealing with or disposing of the property in the manner inconsistent with the existence or the continuation of a trust or by consenting to such an application or investment of the trust funds or property as shown an intent, intention to abandon his right thereto. The cessory may, may also be a stop by such conduct or negligence is calculated as to mislead and does actually mislead an innocent person to his prejudice or by anticipating in a fraudulent or by participating in a fraudulent act affecting the trust property or by engaging in an illegal act. Acts or conduct not showing an intention to abandon his rights in the trust property, however, will be considered a waiver or give rise to an estoppel on part of the sestuary. And nor does the estoppel or waive, waive your rights out of the acts or conduct where at the time thereof the city is without knowledge of a material fact or where his acts are induced by fraud or misrepresentation or where such acts or conduct have not misled the party seeking to invoke an estoppel. A city key trust is not a stop to assert or enforce a trust by the mere fact that the trustee is enabled by virtue of his possession of the trust property to make use of it as his own or by judgment of judicial sale whereby an involuntary trustee acquires the apparent legal title to the property. So this all works for the goose as well as the gander here. Next section, vacation of default judgment. We're under a default judgment declaring that the beneficiary has renounced his rights to income from the trust. The trustee disputes the trust's corpus and such charge or such change of position by the trustee does not stop the beneficiary to claim the right to income on the vacation of such judgment. Next section, settler. 
The settler has been held to be a stop to object to the validation of the trust which he has established, and he may waive his right to conduct positive, unequivocal, and inconsistent with his claim of title under the trust agreement. Next section, trustee. A trustee is a stop to object to the validation of the terms of the trust which he has accepted. Let me read that again. A trustee is a stop to object to the validation of the terms of which he has accepted. So if they wrote you a nasty letter saying they don't want to take this on, they've disclaimed. But the fact by their actions remains that they have accepted the duty because they are acting on their trust res, they are stopped. The trustee is a stop to object the validation of the terms of the trust which he has accepted. And it has been held that the trustee may be a stop to assert rights which his said a key trust would be a stop to assert. Next section, Vendi. A Vendi is a stop to claim that a trust exists in favor of his vendor. Next section, creditors of a trust estate may be a stop by acquiescence or otherwise to assert a preference for their claims arising under the trust. Section 430, next section, persons entitled to enforce the trust. A trust may be enforced or the trust fund or property protected by suit and equity by the trustee or in his right or against the trustee or his successor in interest by the city key trust or his heirs or a purchaser of the equitable title from him or some other person interested in the execution of the trust. A trust may be enforced or the trust fund or property protected by a suit and equity by a trustee or in his right or against a trustee or a successor in interest by a city key trust or his heirs or a purchaser of the equitable title from him or some other person interested in the execution of the trust. Let me read that again. Or some other person interested in the execution of the trust. Where the trustees neglect to defend their legal title to the trust property, the city key trust may do so. The city key may sue to remove a cloud on the title, although the trustee gives the trustee uncontrolled discretion in the executing the trust. On the other hand, the court will not lend in, in its aid in such a manner to result in the transfer of the res of a trust to a person other than the beneficiary thereof, where such transfer is contrary to the intention of the creator of the trust, and where such transfer might be subject the transferee to penalties irrespective of whether the transferee had turned the trust res over to the beneficiary. Next section, voluntary payments. The rule of law that money voluntarily paid under a claim of right which holds facts on the part of the one making the payment cannot be recovered back unless there is fraud, concealment, or compulsion by the party enforcing the claim has been held to have no application where money erroneously paid by uh, paid was held on trust for the benefit of others who had no part in the erroneous delivery and payment by the trustee. Next section, 431, express trust. A suit to establish and enforce an express trust on a trustee's failure or refusal to execute it properly or his breach thereof may and should be brought and maintained ordinarily by the city key trust or those representing or claiming under him. Claiming under him. Hmm. A suit to establish and enforce a, an express trust on a trustee failure or refusal to execute it properly or his breach thereof may and should be brought and maintained by the city key trust or a person for whose benefit the trust was created or those representing or claiming under him, even though he did not know of the creation of the trust at the time thereof. Even though he did not know of the creation of the trust at the time thereof or is not party to an agreement by which the trust was created, or is a public officer not clothed under the ordinary conditions with authority to institute general equity proceedings, in other words, a judge, but were equity for, uh, but for where necessary for an enforcement or protection of the trust or interest affected thereby, such a suit may be maintained by substitute trustee or by the creator of the trust, by the creator of the trust, or by any person who has interest in the execution of the trust, provided his interest is not too remote or and uncertain to warrant the protection of equity. 
protection of equity. Oh, nice place to be. It has been said that we're merely because a member of a class of beneficiaries may ultimately take noting take nothing does not prevent such members from maintaining a suit to enjoin or redress a breach of trust. The suit to enforcement of a trust cannot, however, be maintained by one who has no interest in the trust or its execution. A simple contract creditor of a trust estate cannot invoke the aid of equity where he has not exhausted his remedy at law. Read that again. A simple contract creditor of a trust estate cannot invoke the aid of equity where he does not exhaust his remedy at law. Next section, incidental beneficiary. It has been held that a suit to enforcement of a trust cannot be maintained by a person incidentally benefiting from the performance of a trust of which he, has not, he is not a beneficiary. A person cannot enforce a trust merely because his, he incidentally may profit from the performance of a contract with respect to the property. Next section, 432, resulting trusts. Resulting trust. A suit to establish or enforce a resulting trust may be maintained by the one who has legal or equitable claim to the property, or one acquires title to property under such circumstances as to give rise to a resulting trust in favor of another. The latter may maintain a suit to have such a trust established or enforced or after his death, his heirs may be maintained such a suit unless he is elect, elected not to treat a transaction as creating a resulting trust. The suit to establish or enforce a tr resulting trust cannot, however, be maintained by one who has no legal or equitable claim to the property, nor can such a trust be established or enforced until title to the property is passed to the person against whom the trust is sought to be declared. It is not necessary in order to bring an action to establish the existence of a resulting trust and to compel a conveyance that plaintiff should be in possession of property at the commencement of the suit. Next section, judgment creditors. It has been held that the judgment creditors of an intestate can sue to enforce the resulting trust and property purchased with the intestate's money during its lifetime, title to which has taken in the name of another. Next section, personal representative. A personal representative, a deceased grantor, can enforce a resulting trust on behalf of the heirs of the grantor, notwithstanding evidence that the transfers which the personal representative seek to set aside had the legal purpose of defeating the grantor's creditors. Next section, non-resident. A non-resident has been held entitled to asserting a resulting trust in lands within the state. Next section, 433, constructive trusts. A suit for the establishment or enforcement of a constructive trust may be maintained by the person prejudiced or deprived of the benefit of the fraud, actually or constructive, which gives rise to the trust. A person not prejudiced in any way by the alleged fraud cannot enforce such a trust. A suit for the establishment or enforcement of a constructive trust may be maintained by a person prejudiced or deprived of the benefit by the fraud, actual or constructive, which gives rise to the trust or by the successors and interest of such person. But where the right to maintain such a suit for establishment of a trust depends additionally upon whether he has some legal or equitable right and pass, say, in the trust property, and whether he has participated in the fraud, a person not prejudiced in any way by the alleged fraud cannot enforce such a trust. Next, Section 434, Persons Against Whom Trusts May Be Enforced. A trust may be enforced against all persons who acquire the trust funds or property. Anybody touches those trust res funds, they can be brought against an action. Continuing on, or interest therein with notice of the trust equities or without consideration. A trust may be enforced against the trustee, including all substituted trustees, or one who succeeds to his rights and duties, or against the trustee's personal representatives, or his heirs, divisees, or legatees, if and to the extent that any of the trust funds or property come into their hands, and against all persons who acquire the trust funds or property or interest therein, with notice of the trust equities, or to acquire the trust funds, property or interest without consideration. Did you ever get paid for your property? 
Did you get consideration? Continue on. It may also be enforced against a person not having a prior equitable title. Who in heck's got the equitable title? What title does the trustee have? Continuing on. Moreover, a person knowingly participating with a trustee in a misappropriation of trust funds or property or claiming a benefit from any acts of misrepresentation by the trustee are personally liable to the city, city for the loss resulting therefrom, and such liability may be enforced against such persons and the trustee jointly or severally, where one or more of the several city key trusts participate in a breach of trust, a city key trust who does not participate therein is entitled out of the remaining estate to share in the estate before the breach was committed, and if a loss to the estate occurs through such a breach, he is entitled to have the shares of the city key trust who participated in the breach applied to make the good and loss sustained by him. The trust is not enforceable, however, against one who has not participated in the trustee's wrongful act and who is not unjustly enriched, nor can it be enforced against persons who are not, in fact, trustees. Likewise, a trust is not enforceable against one who acquires a trust property in good faith without notice of the trust or the equities giving rise thereto, and particularly where the city key trust has knowledge at the time of the transaction by which the property is so acquired and fails to object or assert his rights. Nor can any trust be established or enforced against one who has no right in or title to the property sought to be impressed with the trust and has been held at a suit to impress a trust on funds in the hands of a testamentary trustee who were formerly executors, may not be maintained by deceased creditors after the estate has been closed. A voluntary executory trust may not be enforced against either the grantor or his representatives. Next section, advancements from wife's separate estate. In a suit to enforce a partnership trust against a deceased property, deceased wife may make the advancements of her separate estate to the partnership is entitled to a lien on any recovery for the amount of such advancements, irrespective of any ignorance of the existence of the partnership. Next section, dismissal. A suit against a party to establish a trust is properly dismissed as to such party where no relief is sought against him. And release. Next section. A proceeding to enforce a trust has been held to be barred by a general release, executed and delivered by a valuable consideration. Next section, right to follow trust property or proceeds thereof. Section B. Section 435, nature and grounds of right. As a general rule, if the property may be distinctly and identified, traced and identified, and superior rights of innocent third persons have not intervened, a city key trust may, in equity, follow and recover or impress a trust on the trust funds or property. Impress a trust on the trust funds of the property, which have been diverted, no matter what the form, into which they have been converted or into whose hands they have come. As a general rule, if the property may be distinctly traced and identifiable, the superior rights of the innocent third persons have not intervened, a city key trust may, in equity, follow and recover or impress a trust on trust funds or property which have been diverted, no matter what the form into which they have been converted into, whose hands they have come, or in whose name the legal rights stand. If it can be traced and identified, this rule applies. Although the subject matter of the trust consists of money, the principle following trust funds in equity does not apply against one who has participated in the breach of the trust but has retained none of the property or its proceeds or in favor of one who is a stranger to the trust and has no beneficial interest in trust funds. While the simple relationship of debtor and creditor is not sufficient grounds for invoking the doctrine the general rule of doctrine permitting trust property to be followed and discovered in equity applies not only all, to all forms and types of trust, but is applicable in all cases of fiduciary relationships 
or quasi-trust. Thus, property to which others are beneficially entitled may be followed and recovered in equity where it was held by one standing in a relationship of executor, administrator, guardian, or officer of a corporation. And if a mortgagor disposes of mortgage property in such a manner as to affect the mortgagee's security without his consent, the mortgagee is entitled to follow the property as against a third person receiving it with notice of the trust. Next section, public officials. The general rule permitting trust property to be followed and recovered in equity has been held applicable to where a public official misappropriated public funds unless such public official has 436 section next basis of right and necessity of tracing or identifying property. The equitable right of recovery or reclamation generally does not exist or no trust or lien can be enforced if the trust property cannot be identified or traced into some specific fund or thing which is sought to be charged and into which the original trust property has gone in some form or other. The right to follow trust property in equity being based on the theory that the right of property once existed and still exists in the city key trust and is not on the principle of debt due or owing. It's not on the principle of debt due or owing or on a theory of damage or compensation or loss of property, or even on a theory of trust relationship. The equitable right of recovery or reclamation generally does not exist, or trust or lien can be enforced if the property cannot be identified or traced into some specific fund or thing, which is thought to be charged and into which the original trust property has gone in some form or other. The degree of identification required in an action between a city key uh, sestui and the tr trustee depends on circumstances, and it is far, far less than is required where the rights of the third person are involved. Thus, it has been held that equity will follow and protect trust property by specific remedies as long as it can be identified with reasonable certainty or is capable of clear or substantial identification and monies have been held sufficiently identifiable, although they have not been kept as separate or independent fund, or disposed as a special account, the trustee may not permit or may not admit receipt of money and deny liability because the beneficiary does not know where such penny was placed. And tracing, which is constructive rather than actual, has been held sufficient. Although the rights of one claiming to be a beneficiary of a trust who fails to identify the trust funds or follow it through its munitions is limited to that of a general creditor, at least got that, continuing on, and the fact that the beneficiary cannot trace or identify the trust funds or beneficiary does not necessarily preclude him from obtaining any equitable relief. Thus, were a mother serving as a trustee of a irrevocable trust for her children wrongfully withdrew funds from the trust, the children's right to a bond and a mortgage on the realty executed by the mother to herself as guardian of the children, either as restitution of the trust res or security for the repayment of her indebtedness to the trust rests on the fact that she owes the children approximately the amount of the bond and the mortgage, and the fact that it cannot be established that any of the trust funds wrongfully withheld went to property which with a mortgage was given either directly or indirectly is immaterial. Section 437, following or tracing into products or substitutes. The city key trust may follow the trust property through any charge, change in form or species and have the trust attached to the property in its new form. Thus the proceeds which the trustee has received for the trust property may be claimed as subject to the trust. Well, it has been said that the right to follow the recovered property first existed only with reference to the identical trust property in its original form. It was necessary to identify and is now well settled that the city key trust may follow the trust property through any change in form or specie and have the trust attached to the property in its new form. For the product of the trust property follows the nature of the original thing itself. Thus, the city key trust may generally claim 
as the subject to the trust any proceeds which the trustee has received from the trust property or any property into which the trustee has invested or converted the trust property or the proceeds therefrom, thereof, pro, proceeded, of course, the property, or pro, excuse me, provided, of course, the property claimed may be identified as a product into which the trust property may be traced. The mere fact that the trustee has possession of the trust funds at any time when he purchased property is insufficient to trace the funds, trust funds into the property so purchased, and the city key trust, of course, has no claim to property purchased by the trustee before the trust funds came into his hands. Generally, the use of the trust property to secure or satisfy debts incurred to enable the trustee to purchase property does not entitle the city key trust to a trust in the property purchased with the borrowed money. Although a resulting trust will not be created where one person's money is used to pay for property conveyed to another unless the money is paid before or contemporaneous to the purchase as discussed supra in section 120, where trust funds were used to pay for property and may be traced into the same, it is not essential to the city key trust right to charge the property with the trust that the payment be made before or contemporaneously with the purchase. Next section, trust money. If a city key trust can show that the money has in fact gone into such property, trust money can be followed into any form of property into which it has been converted by the trustee, for it is no longer the law that money cannot be traced because it, is, it has no earmark. Next section, substitutes for original property. Where the trust property has been completely dissipated or lost so that it can no longer be followed or recovered, but the trustee subsequently set aside other property as substitute thereof, the city key trust may follow and have the trust attached to the substitute property. Next section, application or profits of product or investment. Excuse me, that's appreciation or profits of product or investment. If the city key trust elects to take the product of the trust property as his own, he is generally not limited to the value of the original trust property, but is entitled to all fruits, gains, and profits of the new property, including the profits made by the trustee in his own personal business ventures and investments, using trust funds, if such funds could be traced, except insofar as the increase in value is due to labor or expenditure of the trustee, but even in the latter case, the trustee is entitled to no charge for the value for his services in wrongfully disposing of trust property. Bank accounts. Next section, when a trust money has been deposited in a bank, the trust attaches to the account or debt created by the deposit, which the Sestui Trust must in, uh, may enforce as long as the fund remains with, unwithdrawn. And if the bank or the third person with the notice of the trust receives money from the account as a private property of the trustee, it may be recovered from the bank or the third person by the city key trust. Next section, insurance. Where the trust, trust funds have been misapplied to pay premiums for an insurance policy, they may be followed into the policy and is generally held in accordance with the rule that the city key trust is entitled to the benefit of any gains or profits of property into which the trust property has gone. And the city key trust recovery is not limited to the amount of the misapplied funds but he is entitled to the proceeds of the policy in the proportion that the payments made from the trust funds bore to the total premiums paid, and the city key trust may recover the entire proceeds where all premiums have been paid with trust funds. Next section, mortgages. Where trust property has been wrongfully used to discharge, it has been invested in a mortgage, the city key trust is entitled in equity to enforce the security interests of the mortgagee but he acquires no ownership or interest in the property beyond the security interest for the amount of the debt. Next section, real estate. It's well settled that where trust funds have been used to purchase real estate, the city key trust may claim the real estate as subject to the trust. And as rules applies, although there is statutory provision against resulting trust where a deed is made to one person and the consideration paid by another, or although the land is a homestead, which is ordinarily exempt from uh, from the payment of debts. However, in view of the fact that equity has, has wide play in shaping its decrees, it has been held that the court may properly impose a lien on the property rather than determining the property was subject of the trust. Next section, business and stock and trade. 
where the trust funds have been invested in business and stock and trade, it is sufficient identification to point out the business as an entity without showing that the stock and the changing, uh, changing parts remain the same for the integrity and identity of the stock of goods as such remains so that it may be followed by the city key trust, although it has been depleted by sales and replenished by purchases from time to time. If the trustee used trust money of his own to carry, in carrying on his business and replenishing his stock of goods, the trust fund will be regarded as investing in the business as a whole and it may be subjected to the trust. Where misappropriated trust funds constitute only monies invested in corporation, the entire property of the corporation with its rents and profits is recoverable by the city key trust. Next section, 438, commingling of trust funds or property in general. Where trust property is commingled with the property of a trustee, the entire commingled funds or property will be treated as subject to the trust unless the trust property may be separated from the rest. As a general rule, the city key trust equitable right of recovery is not destroyed by reason of the fact that the trustee has so commingled the trust property with his own property that it is impossible particularly to identify the trust property. For unless the trust property is such that it can be ascertained and separated from the rest, the entire commingled fund or property will be treated as subject to the trust. To the extent necessary to make good the claim of the city key trust to funds traced to and still found commingled in, the common fund, except insofar as the trustee may be to establish or dis, to distinguish and separate that which is his own. However, property belonging to a trustee, which may be identified not having come from and been commingled with, property is subject to the trust, will not be held subject to the trust merely because the trustee fails to set up a trust by segregating property for the satisfaction thereof. B, money or other property of fungible nature. Although, the heirs is authority, although there is authority for the rule that trust money may be recovered if commingled with private funds of the trustee, is that the rule that most jurisdictions that the particular bills or coin need not be identified, but the city key trust may recover if he can show the particular fund into which the trust property has gone. While there's been a number of cases to the effect that means of ascertaining the ascertainment failed, so there can be no recovery by the city key trust. If the trust property is money, it has been become commingled with private funds of the like character, it is now well settled in most jurisdictions that the city key trust not, need not identify the particular bills or coin, but there may be recover an equivalent amount from the mixed fund or mass if it can be shown the particular fund or mass into which the trust money has gone, such as an individual bank account of the trustee. So it is usually held that commingled trust money must be traced in some specific fund and then it is not sufficient to show that it is somewhere among the general assets of the trust of the trustee, or that it went into one of the several accounts grouped together under a single general classification. There is, however, some authority to, for giving a city key trust a charge on the entire estate of the trustee, where the is so mixed with his general property that it cannot be traced into any particular property or fund. Next section: tracing funds into hands of bank. Where a bank has taken original trust property, it has been held misappropriated by a customer who was a trustee, or its proceeds in any identifiable form, as by the customer's check, set off, or assertion of banker's lien. The trust fund will be traced, and the bank must surrender the property or its proceeds unless it can show that it is a bona fide purchaser without notice. Where a bank received payments on debts due to it by the trustee individual, the funds with which the payments were made from the account, trust account into the trustee's individual bank account and then into the bank's hands, the bank was not a bona fide purchaser and equity would require restoration of the funds to the trust. However, where the individual and the trust funds are so mingled in a depositor's account that the trust money cannot be identified, the study key trust may not it has been held, hold the bank responsible for the amount of the trust funds deposited. The mere fact that the trustee from time to time repaid part of the indebtedness to the, word, to the ward 
has been held not to result in such commingling of funds as to permit the bank, knowing that payments of the trustee's personal obligation were made from the trust funds to escape liability. Next section, shares of stock. If certificates for shares of stock held in trust or commingled with like certificates held in trust, it is not necessary for the city key trust to recover to identify the identical certificates held in trust, but it may take from the mass like a mass a like quantity of the same kind of certificates. Next section, mingling of several trust funds. Where a conscious wrongdoer commingles money of others but not of his own, each owner of the money is entitled to share with the mingled funds or in the property acquired with the funds in such proportion as his money bore to the whole amount of the fund, and the owners share the profits and losses equally. Next section C, withdrawals from and use or investment of mixed funds. In general, if the trustee has withdrawn sums from the common fund, the SSDK trust is entitled to recover to the extent of the trust fund, the lowest balance to which the common fund has been depleted for the reason that the trustee is presumed to have taken his own trust first, his own funds first. As a general rule, the trustee has mingled his trust funds with his own and subsequently withdraws sums from the common mass for his own use, the city key trust is entitled to recover to the extent of the trust fund with the lowest balance to which the mass has been depleted for the reason it has been usually said that the trustee will be presumed to have taken his own funds first so that the remainder is sufficiently identified as trust funds but is there is authority for considering this rule is based on the absolute right of election on the part of the beneficiary rather than mere participation. The presumption is not applicable where the balance of the commingled funds is insufficient to meet the trust obligation or where the commingled funds are completely exhausted. If the commingled funds is at any time reduced to below the amount of the trust fund, it will be regarded as dissipated to that extent so that the limit of the SETI key trust recovery will be the lowest amount to which the fund has been depleted, and the sub subsequently added to the funds from other sources will not be treated as part of the trust fund unless the trustee has added a subsequent sums with the intent of restoring the trust funds, or the, sub or the circumstances under such a restoration can be presumed to be of the amounts wrongfully withdrawn, and some cases seem to go as far as to assume that any subsequent additions are made with the intent to make the trust fund whole. Next section, where several trust funds are mingled. The city key trust may recover his money which has been commingled with other trust funds held by the trustee where it cannot be traced to specific property. Where the funds of several city key trusts have been mingled together, the trustee has withdrawn part of the fund for his own use so an insufficient remains to satisfy the claims of all city key trusts. Some authorities hold that the first withdrawals will be charged against the trust funds first paid in so that the city whose funds has at least deposited may withdraw his funds first and so on inverse order of the deposit until the fund is exhausted with the exception that if the withdrawal is for the benefit of a particular one of the city key trust, it will be presumed to be of his own fund. However, other cases refuse to indulge in any presumption in favor of the city key trust as against others as to whose funds were first used. It is sometimes held being held that all the city keys trust are entitled to the share of pro rata and which remains of the commingled funds it has been suggested the city key trust whose funds are first added to the commingled mass should bear proportionally the loss caused by any withdrawals made before the other trust funds were added. Where the trustee has exhausted the fund in which the funds of several city key trusts have been mingled, the rule that the first withdrawals are to be charged against the first deposits has no application where after the withdrawing of the fund belonging to several city key trusts, the trustees make subsequent additions to the fund, uh, they will be considered as a general restoration in which all the city key trusts will share ratably rather than, by, rather than as making good so far as possible the separate amounts converted for each in order which they were abstracted where a trustee innocently accepted a legacy, commingled it with an account with other trust funds, and subsequently purchased securities with part of the fund, it was held that the legatee should, be share, should share in the securities only to the extent which it was necessary to use her legacy to purchase the securities and would share in the remainder of the fund to the extent necessary to repay the legacy. 
Next section, when a trust company mingles several trust funds and uses part of them as its private business, the amount belonging to each fund is a proportionate share of the whole. Two, investments or purchases with mingled funds. As a general rule, where the trustee buys property with his own and trust funds, the city key trust is entitled to, the cha to a, a charge on the property, at least to the extent of the trust funds traced to it. As a general rule, where the trustee buys property with his own and trust funds, the city key trust is entitled to a charge on the property, at least to the extent of the tr trust funds traced into the same. And according to some cases, the city key trust may be entitled to the whole property of the trust if the trustee does not show the amount of the trust funds involved in the purchase. If the entity, if the entirety of the mingled funds is used to make the purchase or investment, the city key trust is entitled to a charge on the product, although that portion of the property which is, represents the trust funds cannot be, cannot be definitely identified. According to some cases, if any part of the mingled funds is used in making a purchase or investment, the city key trust is entitled to the charge on the product, or other cases have held that where only part of the fund is used, leaving the fund in an amount sufficient to cover the trust fund, the city key trust is not entitled to a charge on a property purchased if he does not show the trust proportion of the fund was so used in order to rebut the presumption that the trustee used his own funds first. If the trustee, after mingling the trust funds, separates from the common fund a portion of it as the fund of the city key trust and invests such portions in his own name, the trust becomes impressed on the money thus set aside and the property in which it was invested where the mingled funds are used in investments into some of which money cannot be traced, but in others it can be traced, it will be presumed that the trust money was all used in the investment into which it can be traced. But when the trustee has withdrawn all of the mingled funds and there is nothing to show that the has become of it, it, there is no presumption that the trust portion is to any extent included or represented in securities, the legal title to which is vested in the trustee where the property has been purchased entirely with the joint funds of several city key trusts which have been mingled together, the entire property goes to the city key trust proportionately. Even though the trust funds and individual funds of the trustee have been commingled and used to purchase property, the city key trust is not impressed a lien on property of the trustee which had been purchased prior to the trust and which can be, which had been kept separate therefrom. Next section, application or depreciation of investment or purchase. Where an investment or purchase wrongfully made in part of a trust fund has depreciated in value, the city key trust may elect to take the lien on the whole to secure repayment of the trust fund, while on the other hand, if there had been profits of or application and value, appreciation and value, the city key trust may elect to become a co-owner of the trustee in proportion that the trust fund bore to the total sum invested in the property and to that extent share in the profits or applications. Okay, section 439 on page 448. We'll pick up maybe there on the next So let's go to the Q&A. Q&A session started. So press star 6, star 1 to get in the uh, queue line and ask a question. Press star 6, star 1. Hey, Christian. Eric. Hey, Eric. Wow, you did quite the marathon. We could we could spend the next couple of weeks talking about what you just got done reading. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was uh, I, I guess I can maybe work from what you read. Uh, a couple of things I, I picked up on that I, I kind of wanted to discuss, and um, one of them was under uh, section 430. Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, let me go back a little bit. Hang on. Um, Uh, 429 and 430, I think it is. Let me just look real quick because I, I have to review now. Uh, 
Um, well, one thing that, that uh, I was really thinking about a lot as you were reading it was a stop or waiver under 429, a set of key trusts or one claimant to be such who is competent to act for himself may be a stopped or waive his right to enforce a trust in his favor by words or acts on his yeah. part, which expressly or by implementation or – Implication is what maybe they. I don't know if that's a typo on there. Um, is implication or implication? That's what it is. It's hard to see. Implication shows an intention to abandon or not rely on or assert such trust. Um, so I guess that what that means is if the the set of key uh, fails to to show the intent to express, then they then they uh, they're stopped uh, through abandonment. What section is this now? Four twenty nine. Four twenty nine. Stop or waiver. Yeah, he can be a stopped if he fails to make the uh the claim. Uh Now, that's why I made a comment that that you know can work both ways. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. It not only the beneficiary, say, of the SETI key, but also works for the trustee. Well, I was I was thinking about that, and in, in terms of what well, we all love to talk about so much mortgages. Um, well, the bank they they're by default, even though they don't have the records to prove it. Uh, when you pay a mortgage off, for example, in the county records, it says that the Beneficiary has uh, has been paid, has been satisfied. So I'm looking at this uh, 429, thinking, well, they fail to actually express through record that they're the beneficiary until that time. So as soon as we claim that we're beneficiary, their set of key uh, trust is stopped based on this uh, on section 429. Yeah, you could glean that from that, yeah. Okay. And also, um, in the uh in the first paragraph, set a key trust or one claimant to be such who is competent to act for himself, may be stopped or waive his right to enforce a trust in his favor by words or acts on his part, which expressly or by implication shows an intention to abandon or not to rely or assert such trust by acquiescing. So your silence is your abandonment, and that's what happens whenever we sign our promissory note, walk away from the closing table, and don't and fail to assert that this that we are the set of key. Yeah, that's exactly what happens, right? Trust and waived, and you abandoned it. So, so that's exactly that situation talked right there in CJS, so for section yeah. 429. That's exactly what happens, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it goes on to say, with knowledge of all the material facts in the alleged trustee's acts in dealing with or disposing of the property in a matter. Now, remember, it, abandonment uh, has to be with intent. If it was not your intent to abandon the property, then you cannot abandon it. So it all comes back and hits. And then they're famous for getting you to brainwash you and sway your intent. But if you stick with your intent, that, that's the key, sticking with your intent. So when did you first realize that you had a trust? Well, you know, that's, that's probably going to be a key thing right there. Okay. Um and then, and with this this kind of mindset, as far as walking away from the table and leaving the note there, um, it, uh, uh, which is acquiescence, and it says with knowledge of all the material facts in the alleged trustee's acts in dealing with or disposing of the property in a manner inconsistent with the existence or continuation of a trust, and and, and it just goes to follow up what you just said. You have to have the intent. Yeah, yeah. or all the knowledge. Yeah. Right. When did you all know? Well, I never really had all the knowledge, so uh, I didn't really know there was a trust here being formed. So how could it be my intent? But that's the way it works on the uh, the sentier side. 
because you have to know what you're doing. But on the public realm, censor doesn't mean anything. As long as they can trick you to create the records, the records proves that's what your intent was, and that's what they go by. And, and, go, and, hey, hey, this was all a mistake, and mistake is under equity, under the second division of equity, so you can go back and claim mistake. And mistake, again, will come back down to intent. And, and then this section goes on to say, or by consenting to such an application or investment of the trust funds or property as to show an intention to abandon his right thereto. Consent. You have to consent or you have to have knowledge. So so it, it's going on every day all around our country. It's been going on for a long time. That's, uh, you consented because you've got – they've got documents – that are signed by you that are records that proves that you consented. Right. And, and, and then the, the next session that you were reading, not that a lot of it didn't ring in my head a lot, but the one that, that really run, rang out was uh, the co-mingling. And um, let, me, let me find the section here that uh, really, really jumped out. Uh, which, Okay, in general, where trust property is commingled with the property of the trustee, the entire commingled fund or property will be treated as subject to the trust unless trust property may be separated from the rest. That could totally wreck every bank out there, couldn't it? Yeah, yep. Because I was immediately what I thought of was mortgage-backed security pools. Uh-huh. And once they commingle it, that means that that whole pool could belong to anybody who signed a single note inside the whole pool. Yeah, okay. but really that, that's another trust, though, and all that is being kept segregated. So it wouldn't be appropriate to glean that from that? Uh, I don't know. It depends which way you're looking at it. Uh, can they be identified within specifically within the trust that is segregated? Is that how they're working around that? I think that's probably how they're doing it because they're putting it into another trust and they're keeping that trust fund segregated. That doesn't mean that that trust fund is not, you know, yours. Just because they securitize and put it in another trust, they're just keeping well uh, the funds well well protected and safe and invested. But you never asked for the funds. So we got all these fat pig funds floating around all over here. In the meantime, everybody gets thrown out and living out in the street and starving. And those pigs get fatter. Uh, yeah, and if you don't hurry up and get your pigs and call them back, uh, uh, they're going to buy... Uh, well, what's the word? I forgot it now. Perspective. Looking, looking forward. Yeah, they're gonna withdraw. They're gonna uh, take away your right. Prospective. You, you mean if you don't act prospectively, you mean? Uh, that that word that the they're gonna take away the right by uh, you haven't claimed it in such a long time. And how does prospective play into that? You never claimed your right. So, so you so don't take it, it away from, from a non-use over time. So are you getting at that you didn't act in a prospective manner? Is that what it is? Is it prospective? You know, it's not. Proscription. Proscription, excuse me. Oh, Okay. Prescription. Because perspective is looking forward. Retrospective is looking back, and I was trying to figure out what you were saying. Yeah, prescription is going to – you're going to lose your right through prescription. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know what you mean now. Thank you. So in 
in reference to what you were saying a minute ago about that they are keeping good books and they take each one of our um, our notes and they put it into each one of those into a separate trust, even though it might be all one pool, they all go into a separate trust within their records. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think they know exactly where everything is because they're solely stuck on record keeping and they know where everything is, except that since you transferred it to them and gave them the legal title to it under a general deposit, now they don't have to tell you anything because really it belongs to them under a general deposit. But here it's mistaken, and it's a special deposit, and under a special deposit, you didn't transfer title to them. You retain title. So when we when we look at it through that, that set of eyes, when we look at commingling of the trust funds or property, as a general rule, the set of key trusts equitable right of recovery is not destroyed by reason of the fact that the trustee has co so commingled the trust property with his own that it is impossible particularly to identify the trust property. So because it's possible to identify based on the record keeping, we our right of recovery is not destroyed. Yeah, because you can trace it. Okay. And then it goes on to say, unless the trust property is such that it can be ascertained and separated from the rest, the entire commingle fund or property will be treated as subject to the trust. So if no. if there's somebody out there that is uh, that is not keeping good records, then by us having the records and proving, we may be able to capture that everything in that trust. Uh, by them keeping good records, yes. No, by keeping them keeping poor records. Poor records. Uh, well, then it'd be hard to trace it then, and it may be harder to get to the funds. I think they're keeping good track of the records, especially if they're government a a entities. Banks and like, I think they know exactly where everything's at. It's just that they keep the off books hidden from certain people and they can't uh, see them. But the records exist. It's just getting to the right parties that have the access to the records. I have some more, but I, I kind of want to um, see. I, I, I'm looking right now to see if there's anything else that I want to I want to go over in what you read because um, there was so much tonight. But if if people are lining up, maybe I'll uh, I'll get back in the queue in a minute. Okay. All right. Nobody else is there. Oh, Keep talking. Okay, great. Anybody then, else? Uh, press star six, star one. Then what, what I'm uh, – the next thing that uh, jumped out at me was uh, the stuff about mingled funds. And as a general rule where the trustee buys property with his own and trust funds, a set of key trust is entitled to a charge on the property at least to the extent of the funds, uh, funds traced to it. A charge on the property, does that mean a lien on the property? Is that a, is that a good way to say it? Uh, uh, could be. Uh, but at least you could make a claim you know, against the property that say that's trust property. So that would be like a, a, a bill in uh, equity. And that's how you can make your claim. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm 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 still going. I uh I'm looking for what else. Cause as I said, you uh you read for quite a while, so there's quite a bit. Another question? 
Yeah, I'm working on it. Um, whether it was with um, um, ill intent or not, if a trustee failed to keep good books, could that in any situation be considered fraud? Yes. Okay. He has a duty to keep good books. And as you're reading through this, and, and all this is coming together, CJS is all, all written from um, cases that have been reported over the course of time, and that's how they create this, right? Yeah, because down below of all the bottom here is all these case sites supporting everything that was written. Okay. Because I, I, I know when I go to the front of the book, I think it says um, – I mean, we're just reading the uh, the uh, regular verbiage on the top, but all this is supported by footnotes with just page after page. In fact, most of it is case sites. Yeah, it says a complete restatement of the entire American law as developed by all reported cases. Uh huh. So the amount of material that we're going over is probably uh, one half. Maybe even no, maybe just one third. The rest of the material, two thirds of it, is all case site supported. The other um, section that really um, rang out to me was persons against whom trust may be enforced, and that was that was really a, a real strong one. And I just had to uh, go back and a trust may be enforced against all persons who acquire the trust funds or property or interest therein with notice of trust equities or without consideration. Now, so I go to the more, I go to the closing table. I sign a promissory note. They accept it. All persons who acquire the trust funds or property. So if they accepted it, I claim trust. They don't have a choice but to accept my indentures, Right. Just like the letter that the uh, fellow read uh, last night, you know, they really didn't say, uh, they really didn't come out and re, uh, close the account. They made it sound like he was the one that's in big trouble here and he better close the account. If they really had the authority, why didn't they close the account? You know, they tried to get him, to coerce him to close the account first. So I think that's saying something for, you know, the the indenture there is really. And then I don't know I made reference was a Saturday night or Monday. I forget. Uh, I said, remember when we were talking about the uh, the agreement. How do we get these people in agreement? Because it had to be an agreement between the parties. So the bank would say, you know, hey, uh, I don't have to agree to this. I don't have to accept your indenture. How are we going to get around that? And I said, you know, do everybody look and do their homework. Go back in the, the, the within the last, say, two months that we we talked about that one time, and I don't think anybody picked that up because nobody made any reference after it. How do we get these banks into the agreement of the indenture? Because otherwise they're going to probably write you a nasty letter like that fellow did uh, Monday's call, and they're going to get a letter back saying that, hey, we don't accept this. Now, what? What? just like you said, what makes them have to accept it? Where, where are they going to get it? How are we going to get them into an agreement with the indenture? I said, everybody do their homework, do their research. Did anybody check on that? 
I'm guilty. I didn't. Where, where, where might we find uh, how we get them into the indenture? Where would we, where would we glean that from? Well, it's, it's again, it's right out of Corpus Juris Secundum. As I was reading it, because I, I pointed that out, I don't think anybody picked that up, but apparently nobody picked it up. Um, which, uh, which book? Uh, without me looking, I think it was under when we were talking about the depositaries, and it might have been about the nature of the deposits right along in there. So that would have been in the D book? Well, it could have been under the banks and banking book, uh, under special deposit. In fact, I think that's where it was, yeah. Well, if anybody else has CJS, I, I'd sure be open to hearing what you got there, because I don't have them all. Um, so I guess in order to get the answer to my question, we got to go back to what it actually takes to get them into agreement, binding agreement. Yeah, I think we're going to have to know that, because when they come up and say, hey, you know, this indenture is no good. we got no trust here. We didn't agree to that. What are you going to say? you got to have some kind of authority to, to hammer them with, right? Yeah, or else the judge is going to sit there looking at you. He's going to give you about 30 seconds, and if you can't answer in 30 seconds, I'm afraid you're dead, probably. So just because they accepted the res is not enough. I have to know how to play some of this at law game, maybe until equity is solidly put in place, and then you can get in there. Why would you need their consent if you're the uh, the trustor of the trust? Well, that's kind of like the thing. How did we get their consent? Their agreement. He's good, isn't he, Harold? He answers a question with a question. <laughs> well, I want to do all the answers, uh, you know. Otherwise, nobody does any research. Well, I guess uh, in order to um, get my answer, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to read up on that one. Well, I'm looking in uh, book ten, bills and notes, if it's in here. I think we were talking about special deposit at that time. And it was like, okay, how do we get a special deposit ag agreement, which would basically be the indenture? Maybe it wasn't depositories. I don't see it in there quick. Why wouldn't you, uh, basically because they haven't responded or said, no, we don't want to be the trustee, um, they have acquiesced. They, they agreed upon it by not disagreeing. So, so not Mike, what you're saying is by action. Yeah, by their action of not saying no. They agreed, and they accepted the uh, indenture, the trust order, and by them not saying within a specific period of time that, no, I do not want to be a trustee, they have acquiesced by their silence. And, and agreed by tacit agreement. 
Right. So there, there's your proof right there. If the judge turns around and says, hey, you know, then you turn around and said, there is a trust here. They are the trustee. They never uh, got back to me and said, no, they don't want to be a trustee. They have acquiesced, period. Now they have to carry out the order. And it's your, and it's your job, Mr. Judge, to make sure that they do it. Otherwise, you're in contempt of the trust, and I'll go to your superior, your administrative judge, and come after you and your bond. You got to have some balls. Because they're getting us on acquiescing, we can turn around and do the same thing to them. It's good for the goose and good for the gander. Well, if you don't that's, watch on them geese, they'll come bite you too. Well, that's why you got to have all your paperwork in order and say, hey, they were given a specific amount of time to respond to this and say no. And it was 14 days. They chose not to respond. So guess what? They acquiesced, period. And those geese will make a heck of a yard, yard watchdog too. So beside uh, acquiescence or by action, by their non-action, right? Or 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 by action, okay? Which which we can say acquiescence is is action. Um, is there other ways to get them to uh, come into agreement with that you're discovering, Christian? Yes, in fact, it's more powerful than the acquiescence. Are you hunting? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, while you do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, bring a little bit more out of uh, who trust may be enforced. Well, hang on, my my phone is here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is under banks and banking. This is under section 12 deposits and under section 283 is special deposits. I think that's where it's. At. A bank in Banking, Section 283, and what book number is it? That's uh, Book 9. Okay, Section 284, Determination of Character of Deposit. It says the character of a deposit as general or special is a question or fact to be determined by the intention of the parties as revealed by their agreement in all the circumstances of the particular case involved. So a bank deposit is ordinarily a general deposit. There is a rebuttable presumption that a deposit is general and the burden of proof is on the party claiming that the deposit is special. The absence of a specific direction or agreement, specific direction. That's an order or agreement. So it's got to be one or the other because there's an or between there. One is specific direction or agreement. So since we do not have an agreement, a specific direction is sufficient. Because we walked away from the closing table without an agreement, but at this point, if we were to uh, issue specific direction, command, order, or direct, non precatory issues spoken about in the past, that would be consistent with what you just said. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's go on. In the absence of a specific direction or agreement to the contrary, a deposit is general. A deposit is special only if the money is placed in the bank for the purpose of safekeeping or on the understanding that the bank shall act as bailey or only if it is made for a specific purpose. And remember, these are all have ors in between here. Spe 
specific purpose. Continuing on, with special instructions or an agreement between the bank and the depositor to use the funds for a special purpose. An agreement may be manifested by the bank's acceptance of a conditional deposit. If the agreement of the bank to, to a special deposit is to be implied by its acceptance of a deposit, accompanied by a written instruction, writing should set forth by clear direction what the bank is required to do. The written instruction or the special instructions is your specific direction, is your agreement. They don't have to agree. You've got to order by special instruction a special deposit. And when you do, that takes the place of an agreement. And that's the determination of the character of the deposit. That's in 284, Section 284, Book 9, Banks and Banking. Boy, that'd be great if you could scan that one page and share it with us. So the general or special character of the account is a question of fact to be determined by the purpose for which the deposit was made. Who establishes the purpose of the deposit? The grantor. The relationship existing between the depositor and the bank and the intention of the parties as expressed in their contract. There's the agreement again. And as revealed by the facts and the circumstances of the case. Don't we have exigent circumstances? Continuing on. Such as the words and acts of the parties and their course of business. The mere size of the deposit standing alone is not an indication that the account is special. The fact that the deposit is marked special or bears some other particular designation is not controlling, nor is the lack of such a distinction conclusive. So the bank's failure to maintain the segregation of the deposit funds is an indication that the deposit is general. An individual retirement account established with a bank in accordance with federal tax law constitutes a special deposit. And then it starts going into some other stuff then. So then right after that comes Section 285 now, which is the change in character of deposit, where we came up with the withdrawal and the redeposit to change the character, the nature and the character of the deposit from general to special. And then following 286 was the deposits for a specific purpose. Anyway, that, that whole section is, is good because it's all talking about special. Okay, yeah. Well, that, that sounds like that's totally consistent with that document from 1794 that you shared before about it's by the will of the grantor is the nature of the deposit. Christian? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Where did you get the 284? What volume was that? Uh, number oh, nine. Uh, number nine, and that was under uh, depositories? Uh, banks and banking. Oh, banks and banking, my favorite subject. <laughs> so, Christian, what you just read is consistent with that uh, that that document from 1794 about the nature of the deposit is by the will of the grantor. Yeah, yeah, ties in with that too. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to find out. God, I wish I had that book because I'd like to see the case that they uh, the cases that they use to uh, derive that tax from, that would be some great authority. Uh, Christian, in regards to the co-mingling, going back to the section that you read out tonight, could it not be construed that a, a conversion of collateral is a co-mingling of... Uh, yes. right? Yeah. Because uh, I was thinking that any 
time did they take what is a vested interest that's supposed to be in safekeeping and they convert it or they use it in some form that has not had the permission or the consent of the signer of that note, they have just violated, trespassed the whatever intent that that person originally had is that these guys were supposed to be trusted, but behind the backs of the person that signed these notes, they took and prostituted everything they possibly could, including making you a slave to the FRNs on top of them taking and ripping and raping as much wealth out of you as they possibly could by doing that. Yeah, that's what they have uh, seem to be doing. I like what you read tonight. That was uh, some of the best reading we've uh, we've done so far up to this point. But I think all the funds, you know, are still held in trust in these big fat pigs waiting for somebody. But they're going to do the prescription, and they're going to take all your rights away that you no longer have the rights to that, and then they're going to liquidate everything. They're going to use that as a sleight of hand to take all the assets that they've been accumulating and holding for you because of our own stupidity or slumber or whatever you want to call it, that they're going to take these funds eventually. What um, what do you feel outside of, uh, <clears throat> like we were talking, I don't know if it was last night or a couple nights ago, we were talking about the IRS forms. Um, what about reporting that you want to collect these things with other institutions or agencies of the government? Is is that you're giving them notice that no, these are not considered abandoned, and I am, uh, you know, uh, coming to majority of knowing what it is I need to do in order to claim these, but in the meantime, just giving notice, wouldn't that suffice for some people until they can get educated to put a claim on these things and not have them? Uh, presumed as abandoned to where these people can just take off and rip, rip you off for it? So, remember, the, the abandonment really has to have intent. So, if you, if you intended to abandon it, uh, then you've abandoned it. But if you didn't intend to abandon it, then you didn't abandon it. And there has to be some declaration of abandonment, right? Uh, well, you know, in their realm, there are records with they duped you into creating. So, on the public side, it looks like you abandoned it, but on the private side, you really didn't. Because on the private side, you have to have intent, and your intent was nobody would abandon those funds. You know, really? I mean, but in their rightful mind. You know, about it, that uh, they've got the records to prove that you have abandoned it. You know, so. So until we establish record. Yes, that's the problem. I mean, I got to establish the record. You got to withdraw from general and redeposit a special. But you know, today, what is our major problem? Our major problem is that we're on a debt currency system, fiat currency, that has gone way out of proportion. Now, what are we going to do when we get all these big fat pigs? and slaughter them all and got our warehouse chuck full of this beef. Well, you're going, you're going to, to be tempted. Work the theory. You're going to be tempted to go out there and buy your 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 beautiful little heinies off. <laughs> but that's the bait and the trap that will keep you locked into the system because what you must do with this debt when you get it out of these big fat pigs is you must extinguish it. Get rid of it because this is the very thing that is causing the whole problem. Not for the fact that the debt is a sin, not even looking at that, but as a Christian, I have to. But the fact is that this debt is a weight upon everybody's shoulder and it must be gotten rid of. Let's face it. You don't need $35 billion in fiat currency debt or credit to live on. 
at the max, if you had seven to ten million in the bank, you could live off the interest for the rest of your life. And there was no way possible that anybody could really do more with, say, two hundred million dollars anyway. Why would you need thirty five billion plus or more? And let's look at it this way. The fact is, at any given time, you have the ability to create as much credit at any time you want. Why have it available sitting around now causing problems? Get rid of it. Extinguish it. You don't need it. It's causing everybody problems. Deflate the currency thing by extinguishing it thereby raising the value of the dollar back up to where it was. And now your dollars are worth something. You know what they've been doing? The more debt you create, they must lock it up in treasury securities and lock it away someplace because they've got to control the money supply in order to control the velocity of the money. They want to keep the upward pressure of the velocity of the money always in an upward state. And they do that by drying up the money supply by putting it into securities and investing it in treasuries and locking it away. There are untold trillions upon trillions upon hundreds of trillions of dollars locked away in the treasury of all the free currency debt that all of us have been doing on the debtor-creditor route all along this time with our offset bonds, our private offset bonds, and all the bonds and the things we've been creating, thinking that that was the, the key to get out. And you compound a debt on top of debt, paying debt, and you contribute to the problem. Now, we've got to stop it. We are the problem. So when we terminate the master straw man account and they plop down to $35 billion in securities and treasuries right in front of your lap, what are you going to do? You're going to put them back into, secure, into circulation under the debtor-creditor realm? Or are you going to give them a power of attorney to extinguish all that debt? That's the reality of it, folks. If I find all of where this debt is, I'm going to get rid of every bit of it because I don't need more than, say, $10 million. Questions? So, so, hey, I got something else out of the CJS that, um, out of the trust book that I wanted to um, discuss. Go ahead. Okay, it's uh, Section 430, Persons Entitled to Enforce. A trust may be enforced or the trust fund or property protected by a suit in equity by the trustee or in his right or as against the trustee or his successor in interest by the city key trust or his heirs or a purchaser of the equitable title from him or some other person interested in the execution of the trust, some other person interested. Um, what jumps out there, of course, is interested. That would mean a person who has a equitable interest. Is that? Am I gleaning that properly? I don't know. That kind of reads like uh, anybody has a kind of like a desire to help out to execute the trust. Uh, that's kind of the way I construe that, but you know. I don't know if that would fly too well in the public realm because they may get you for an unlicensed practice of law working on behalf of somebody else because you really didn't have an equitable interest. But it just seems to me like it's reading that any interested party in, in the execution of the trust could step in here and enforce it. On behalf of somebody else who does have an equitable interest or a right to the trust. We might be able to glean a little bit more out of that by the uh, the text that follows. Um, and I know you read it earlier, but, but there's a lot in every one of these words. So um, 
a trust may be enforced or the trust fund or property protected by a suit in equity by the trustee or in his right or as against the trustee or his successor in interest by the city key trust or his heirs or a purchaser of the equitable title from him or some other persons interested in the execution of trust where the trustee neglects uh, where the trustees neglect to defend their title, their legal title, to the trust property, the set of key trust may do so. And the set of, and the SETI may may sue to remove a cloud on the title, although the trustee gives the trustee uncontrolled discretion in executing the trust. On the other hand, a court will not lend its aid in such a matter as to result in the transfer of the res of a trust to a person other than the beneficiary thereof, where such transfer is contrary to the intention of the creator of the trust and where such transfer might subject the transferee to penalties irrespective of whether the transferee had turned the trust res over to the beneficiary. Huh, I don't get anything in there about person interested in the execution. Did you guys? What was your last statement? Out of what I just read, I didn't get anything that explains a person interested in the execution. That really explained it better than simply, you know, gives us any more information than a few words that they put in the uh, in the bold type at the beginning of the section. Yeah, well, that's why I keep on saying, you know, the safe bet is to make sure you got some kind of interest in the trust. Right, right. Beneficial, legal. And, uh, of course, we know trust is right to title and interest, so um, so yeah, as long as we've got we some other places, it kind of reinforces the fact that maybe somebody could act on behalf of somebody else as an interested party because that person he was acting on is kind of like an agent. Uh and that person he's acting for has or has to have a, a, a legal right or a beneficial right, and that person could act in his, in his uh, capacity to help that party out. But like I said, the public side I don't think wants to see that. You probably get slapped with a license to practice lawsuit, you know, unlicensed practice law. Yeah, this uh, this retired judge we met in California, Chris and I did, um, said, if you come to my court and practice law on behalf, on behalf of somebody else, I'll, I'll put you in county jail for six months. That's exactly what he said. So, of course, he's talking on the statutory side, but still, he, uh, he asked me a couple times if I was an attorney. So I know what he's looking for. Out of everything you read, that's really what I gleaned. Do you have other other callers in the queue, Christian? Yeah, we do. Yeah. All right. Well, go ahead and take some of them, and uh, and I want to go over the maxims. But we can once you get to them, in case any anybody has any pressing situations, I got to discuss with you, and then we'll go back to the uh, the um, the maximum 126 between equal equities and the law. Okay. The law will right. prevail. So we can we can talk about that some more later. Thanks so much. All right, so next caller, you're unmuted. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Christian, hi, it's Jacob. Hey, Jacob, how are you? I'm okay. Yourself, you sound like you're doing good. Great read tonight. Um, I had a question about mortgages with the things that you read about tonight, where we have a third-party debt collector, not a lender, that's coming after us for something that doesn't belong to them, which would be the escrow account of uh, sweat equity payments, the uh, hoarding of the promissory note that they never came forward to uh, make uh, the sign or a party to, and with the fact that they're hiring a trustee attorney firm who's not doing their due diligence uh, by bringing in a client with no standing when they only have an interest in the lock-lock description 
and they're having the trustee slash attorney firm um, act as if they're there to collect the whole kit and caboodle, all these things that belong to the signor. So with all the stuff that we read tonight, um, where um, where we whereby we are uh, ordering via special instructions by special deposit, withdrawing the general uh, public placement that we've gotten ourselves into, and um, where there's a change of character of the deposit, where we've executed the withdrawal and uh, redirection of the deposit, the special deposit for a specific purpose, and um, we um, um, express all that I just mentioned. That should be enough to where they are uh, compelled to have to accept uh, all the trust law and banks and banking law um, that within the construct of all that. It would would you agree with that? I would say you probably claim trust, but uh, what you said, I would say that you didn't prove trust. You well, came in I, I, kind of lies, but uh, I, I didn't see where you came in with any SOIs to say that there was a trust. And then they could probably say, well, I, I still don't see a trust. With the SOIs or without? Well, with the SOIs, yeah, there, there would be a trust. But, you know, you, uh, from what you said, you know, you made a claim for trust. Now, if they don't say, okay, if they recognize you that, then I would say you're okay. But... If they would say, I don't see a trust, now you're going to have to come up with the SOIs. Yeah, where's, but where's the let's, proof? Say, let's, say, let's say you have the SOIs, but let's say they're coming at you fast, okay? And so you've got to make some kind of an indenture push uh, where you're doing the, the claiming and the transferring, and you've got your SOIs. You put your notices out there. You're also giving notices to the parties as well as to the county. And... Um, you can claim trust that uh, will time out in 30 days. So you've got an amount of time to come in with the SOIs and get supported. But there's where you're going to attach the notices, the UCC 1s and 3s in the counties. Uh, that would be enough prima facie case support that would get you into an in-camera hearing to bring in the actual facts, the material facts of support. The SOIs? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's like it would come in with a pleading. They make accusations in the pleading, but then they put attachments with it, the note and the security agreement, but copies, which is sufficient enough to make a prima facie case. Okay. And what about if we were to bring in also... Now, wait. Uh, now, wait. The actual okay. copies are not the original note, not the original security agreement. You did an evidentiary hearing to bring those things in. A lot of people don't challenge the copies to get to a point to where they're going to bring in the originals. They don't have to go that far. But you got to do the okay, same now, thing. Can, can, you got to do it. I, 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 okay. So at least you got to make a prima facie case, which would be make the claim, which would be like the pleading, and then attach the copies to support it, prima facie case, which would be the notices. And then come in on an in-camera hearing, your evidentiary hearing, to bring in your originals that would support the original material facts. Okay, now what, what would happen, I've got a situation exactly what you're talking about right now, and I'm right in the middle of it. And um, unfortunately, uh, there was a uh, second motion that was written um, that we did bring in the uh, 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 connotation case. And we did, you know, we got caught in a situation where we had to bring in proof um, that there was a trust in order to uh, scoot out the back of a quiet title action where we control the title. Um, uh, and so can you switch your – can you switch the motion to where you can – uh, ask for an equity hearing instead of a, 
you know, an at-law hearing? Yeah, were you on a call last night when we went over the five things that that fellow put in a detainer hearing? I believe so. I might, I'll might. i have to check. Off the top of my head, let's figure remember what they were. You know, he said, my name is so-and-so. I'm beneficiary, uh, grantor beneficiary. Yeah, hold on. I think I have them in my hand. Let me look. Um... Five things. Well, that was right before the coupon conversation, right? Yeah, we said number two, this this hearing is contrary to equity, and number three, trust is special matter, and four, there exists quote no adequate remedy at law. Right. And five, I invoke the private side of equity for relief. Right. I wrote all that down. I do remember that now that you mentioned it. I do have it. I think the real things out of those five was that he specified his name was so and so a grant or beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And the third one I think is probably, you know, trust is a special matter and four, there's no adequate remedy at law. Okay. And we got the four, no adequate remedy at law, equity jump in and say, Hey, I gotta give you a remedy. I gotta give you a relief. Okay. Well, I think with just well, those pieces in there, you probably could have got a uh, at law hearing switched over and redirected into an equity trial or an equity hearing. But should I, should, I mean, how should I do that? Should I do that with another motion or a judicial notice? With, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, would, I would put a notice in there for a hearing, and then the reasons why would be that. You know, my name is so and so grant or beneficiary. This hearing is contrary to equity. Mm -hmm. Trust special matter. There exists no adequate remedy at law, and I invoke the private side of equity for relief. Okay. Now I will share with you, Christian, that um what I just expressed to you a little bit earlier, I did do that in a format in which a uh so-called third-party debt collector actually brought Annie Mae out of the woodwork and they did a sale of a home uh, without notice. And uh, I turned right around and uh, re-recorded a bunch of documents, expressed the trust, and um, it, re it released the, it, re it uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, it retracted the sale and put us back into title position. So right. that was, there's a very powerful thing that you're teaching. I watched it actually happen just a week ago, exactly the way you've been teaching us. Yeah, well, the equitable maxim that goes with that is the one that says that equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. Okay. So you're claiming a wrong, and equity steps in and says, you know, I got to give you a remedy. I got to give you a relief. Okay. There has to be a hearing. Okay. Now, the, when you mentioned earlier about trust equity, are, are the trust equities the proceeds from the trust? Uh, yeah, that would be trust res. Those are equities of the trust. Right. Trust res. Now, with regards to those uh, equities being traced, or using tracing, um, in a, with, with the proceeds from the note and the sweat equity from the escrow account, we would, um, if we were to prove that uh, there was no lien from certain uh, government, you know, uh, methods to search for liens and prove that there were no liens. Uh, having a record from two federal departments that there were no liens, there were no loans, and then we had traced the uh, notes or QSEPs and the sweat equity through the FASB 140 general accounting practices where we could get a, 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 a uh, I guess, an evidence, evidence of a double ledger entry system that we could use to show that 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 those were where we could prove those? Because you said we had to prove those, did you not? Tonight, when you read? 
To prove what again? The uh, the trust equities. We'd have to prove them. Yeah, they have to be traceable. Yeah, identifiable, yeah. And traceable. We'd uh -huh. have to prove that they were put into trust, and then once you prove they were in trust, they're trust assets. They're they're trust res, and then right. yeah. equity's going to search them down. Okay, seek them out. You mean? Yeah. Okay. Now, if if we if we've um, ordered the uh, greater to the lesser merging of the titles, and we now have a payment made, and we have an extinguishment of the liability title, um, is not there something left over if they do not do the extinguishment that would give us uh, uh, our, our, what would be our trust receipt, basically? Could we not put our trust receipt into safekeeping? It would as, represent as a, the remainder, yes, right? Yeah, then it would represent the specific purpose that's been paid off with special instructions from the gatekeeper, which would be a trust bank account keeper, uh, with those special instructions, you know, to say that this is the evidence of the payoff. Of the, our trust receipt is the evidence of the extinguishment of the liability obligation. Is that accurate? Yeah, if, if there was a remainder left over, yeah. Well, I would make I, we would make the grantor sign or the uh, remainder beneficiary along with making the bank the income beneficiary when we remove the uh, uh, when we fire the uh, their trustee and make the bank the trustee and make them the income beneficiary. Right, so the trust receipt would represent the, the extinguishment of the debt, and and the and the, and the beneficiary and the and the remainder beneficiary would represent a place to tie down the bonds that are floating out there and the escrow account funds, wouldn't it? Well, if it, if the indenture stated that a receipt and the record was the the remainder, if that's what it was supposed to be done in the indenture, yeah, then that that's that's doable, but. I don't know. It was probably the whatever the indenture might say. Well, whether it be converted or reduced to say cash, or whether the note be given back in the same kind, or whether it be used for you know uh, that's all up to the how it was written. And if there was a remainder, well, it would be written up so that you could modify the deed of trust yourself, and you could convey the property yourself. You wouldn't even need court to do it. You would just use the rest and do a reconveyance and a payoff. You could leave a legal demand and get rid of them. Yes, because the equitable of asset doesn't have a say a, a value as such, although it's implied towards a value, and the value gets sucked up in the unlimited value of the equitable asset. But then, how do you determine what's left over? Well, you'd have to have an algorithm worked out, and I have one for the, you know, for the pool, and then you could kind of. You know, they give you a debt validation, which is just a copy of your payments you could use as the res for the validation of debt, couldn't you? Uh, yeah, well, I think the trust receipt is by at least going to represent that the debt has been paid. And you, you might have to come up with some other way of getting some kind of remainder back out other than being represented by a trust receipt, though. You'd have to, like, get maybe a, a check or something or something back. When the trust was terminated, I don't I don't know if your trust receipt would qualify so much as being a remainder or an asset. Well, I would I would have several trust receipts. I would I would claim the promissory note is res. I would claim the deed is res. I would claim the equity is res from those derivatives is res. So I'd have four trust receipts. You might, but uh, I don't know whether the trust receipt would be good enough, say, recognizable in our realm to say, do something. Well, if, with, I gotta, if, I, if, if I get, if I if I put the trust res, the promissory note, into safekeeping, I can get a, I can get a trust, a banking trust, you know, a, a banking trust receipt as well. All right, if you put it back in trust, maybe so, but you know. Yeah, I would put it back into a trust bank account. Possibly, yeah, that might work that way. Yeah.
And I might even be able to get two sets. But I'm, what I'm saying is that in order to play, it's like use it in the public, you're going to have to have it in a usable form that, form that the public can see, that that's recognized in some kind of, you know, they're used to seeing. They want well, to see some credit or they want to see some kind of uh, uh, money or something that they, you know, probably those two. Why don't we just put it on a weekend dance and, and record it? Well, that's possible. Hey, that's Paid with trust receipt number such and such. Done deal. Then they got to come after you. You, you. you finished with them. Yeah, that might work, yeah. Okay. Well, I have one that's just about done. So I've already been doing that, by the way, but I'll let you know how it all comes out. Take a few more months. Right. Christian, thank you so very much. Ron Tamish, I appreciate all your hard work. You're a real brother. Okay, thanks, Jacob. Appreciate it. Okay, Frank, are you unmuted? Carlos, you're unmuted. Hello, Christian. Hi, Carlos. Hi, Dan. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, you better watch it if you want to record something on, on in LA County. They'll get you for slander of title. That's a big one right now, especially with this. Uh, everybody doing their administrative process and reconveying and uh, doing some funny stuff. Mm -hmm. They're going to jail. But anyway, I wanted to address the uh, the question that they had yesterday. They had three guys came up, and they were trying to uh, assign their cells or have some someone convey a percentage of the uh, property so they can come up in front of the judge and fight for the property. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Did, did they figure it out? How did that? I because I just got back in. The, I just got in the call right now. That, that's why I'm asking. Uh, that's I haven't heard, heard back from so I don't know. Okay, well, <clears throat> the way the way I would do it is very simple. I'm sure you, I'm sure you, you'll agree with me. It's just yes. Go, going back to what I've, I've been uh, saying for about one or two or three months. Uh, yes, conveyed, commit the property into a land trust. We know that. Mm -hmm. Yes, assign yourself your percentage, and nobody has to know. And it's legal. You can record it. And all, all I all I do is assign a percentage. Nobody knows. And if I ever have to bring it up, I pull it out. It's, it's uh, notarized. There it is. I mean, you're 100% you, legal. But right. That's real, real simple. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what I think, I think that, that everybody that I wanted to uh, call back yesterday, but I got a little too late. And uh, this gentleman, I think one of them from California, they say they, they lifted his automatic stay, had the same problem. Uh, two attorneys attacked this other person that, I want, uh, that I'm trying to help. They attacked him. He's on Banker 7. But I came back stronger, and, and I, sp I came back stronger and started beating them up. And having proof, uh, having proof who they were, and proof that they had standing. I, I, I even brought in the uh, Judge Buford, who is on our side. Okay, that quiet and done for now. Now we gotta go to that, to that trial. But it did stop that automatic lift. So once they lift it, you can still fight it back. That's what I'm trying to say. You mm -hmm. can fight it back, even even if the uh, judge denies it. I mean, he knows they don't have the right to lift the automatic say. It's against the, uh, it's against the, uh, I think it's a 362. It's against the uh, bankruptcy court for them to lift it, but they, they still go ahead and do it. Even though they'll go ahead and do it, at least you have it in record. If you ever end up in a bill, you have it in record, you fight for it. And the judge knows better. He knows better. But anyway, I think that where, where everybody's dropping the ball, Christian, big time, not everybody. I'm sorry. Not everybody. Most of the guys that are here on the call, <clears throat> they're not doing their foreclosure investigation. What I mean by that, I did mine foreclosure investigation, and I, I didn't do it personally. I paid someone who has the license to do it. He gave me all the documents. Guess what? Everything in the 99% uh, 90, of the stuff that they, that they must do and record in a certain process, in a certain order, 
in the county is wrong. For instance, they filed a document. They filed a document. It is notarized. Good. It's notarized, but they, they file it and they sign it on a date and sign it and notarize it in a different date. That means that the person was not present. So I'm going to go personally after that notary's bond. That's on my personal one. So that's, that's um, basically what I'm trying to get, the point that I'm trying to uh, bring across, because they're facing, uh, they're facing the, uh, the UD, the unlawful detainer. If they can come back, th there, is, there is case law in this uh, unlawful detainer. When they did a process, they did not live by law, and you bring it up, they case, there's case law to back it up, and they have to vacate the judgment. That's pretty mm -hmm. much all. That's pretty much all. But uh, I, think, I think we're not doing our homework when it comes to uh, foreclosures. We're not doing our homework. It's, it's the simplest thing and the most basic. If we start at the process of the foreclosure process, you can most likely you said uh, you said it the other day. There should not be foreclosures with everything else so far, and everything that the, the court knows and the judge knows. Everybody knows there should not be any, any foreclosures. But we're not doing our homework. We're not fighting back. That's it. Right. Yeah. Don't you don't you agree? You, you mentioned that the uh, uh, how did you put it? We're not doing our homework, and you went to somebody. Who was that again? Okay. Okay. No, what I did, what I'm, what I did, I, I, I hired this person. He's a forensic auto examiner. Okay, that's what I was digging at. Uh, right. So this, this fellow has like a uh, license to do this forensic yes. examination. Yes, yes. Well, if he has a license, it's worthless. Yeah. So it's now, where do we find one of those for the people out there? Oh yeah, he's a, I have a great one. Can I see his name? I guess well, so. most, of, most of them know, know them. I mean, he's public. I mean, his, his name, he's in California. There are some other ones. There are some uh, uh, good ones. And there's, there's uh, Linda Zimmerman in Florida. And, this, and there's, uh, there's also Charles Horner in California. But for yeah. the guys in California. Charge. What do these people charge? 495. But Christian, on my, on my, on my loan, I have world savings, world savings. I'm under three years, and I rescinded my loan yesterday. And I have all the rights, and he gave me a very professional word document. And, I mean, this, this thing is worth every penny, every penny I spend on it. So I rescinded my loan. I'm going to fight back. I don't want to jump into, um, into uh, bankruptcy unless I have to. And, and I'm just waiting, prolonging it, so that I want to do it under entity. But it's well worth it. If you see this document, he says, well, it's well worth it. Just, just for the fact that you bring it up to the judge from someone who has a license and prove them that their, their process from the uh, notice of default, they give you the notice of default, and they're not even the trustee yet. They don't have any power to go forward. I mean, right. that's, that's how basic it is, but we, we're just dropping the ball. Yeah. And I've been saying this for more than once, but I guess it goes into the wrong ears. But anyway, his name in California, for the guys in California, his name is Charles Horner. Charles Horner. They call him Chuck Horner, and he's in San Diego, and uh, he's great. He's one of the top in California. 495 for the... Uh, Forensic, uh, they call it forensic examination or loan examination, and he, it, it also covers the uh, foreclosure investigation. That's what he calls it. But he'll give you. He, I'm sorry. Were you on the call last uh, yesterday, Monday? I was at the at, at the end, but I, I I got. I mean, you were, you were just going home, but I was there only for about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, Earlier, when we went in the Q&A there, we had a, went over an unlawful detainer action that we had uh, that uh, got rerouted to a new trial. Right. I heard that the end of that, and that's interesting, and, and I have a recording from one of the, uh, the good fellows here and, uh, from, from your other half. And it should be there, so I'm going to enjoy it. Thank you. Take a okay. Yeah, but anyway, go ahead.
going back to the basics, uh, for those guys in California, if they want to give me a ring, I have a very powerful um, a position of uh, automatic stay when they want to lift it. A position of uh, lift uh, automatic stay. I have a real powerful one that I made myself. It, it should stop in their tracks and I'll let you give it more time to fight back. But if, if they lift it, you, you still have to come back and, and make a record because they don't have the right to lift it. But they did it. Okay, Rich. Uh, I'm sorry, Christian. Thank you. Okay, Carlos. Thanks. Next caller. You're unmuted. Next caller, whoever. He just dropped off. Okay. Next caller, then. Anybody have a question? Press star six, star one, get in the queue line. Frank, you're unmuted. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, uh, what was the number of the book that we, you were reading out of tonight? Uh, see, that was uh, Corpus Juris Secundum, uh, book 90. Oh, it was book 90. Uh, okay. And uh, I was then on the deposit. Okay, uh, the deposit, that was book 9, not book 9. Book, but yeah, but the thing I want to mention was, right, that the deposit uh, – Risk receipts or not deposit receipts, but it's deposit slips. Uh, you look for a bank that has one that says UCC collections uh, done in a or collections are done in accordance with UCC Uniform Commercial Code, and um, then you could probably alter or put a stamp or something and write in because I've seen that done on uh, other things saying by Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, collections, and on that, as your special instruction is to say, by special deposit and, co and special collections only. Mm -hmm. And that might be all the uh, instruction or direction you you need or wanted to go along with it, and then maybe in, a, like you say, in a launch with a special uh, instruction or direction also on there. Okay. Right. When I'm sorry, I missed that unlawful detainer. I don't know. I, I guess I, I must have drifted off last night, uh, but I was listening. Uh, huh. Was that in the earlier part of the call or the later part of the call? It's been the later part, right? Just right after I did the read, it was the first uh, uh, first caller on the Q&A. Yeah. And then towards the end of what he was talking about, we brought in the uh, – the NTT success for the unlawful detainer, and then at the end of the show, the last 45 minutes, the actual fellow came on that that had the action, and he explained in his own words what happened. Wow. Well, do you know who what his name was, or uh, how to get a hold of him? Uh, yeah, his name was Keith. Uh, Keith on tonight. Uh, I haven't heard him yet so far, but. Maybe maybe you got to. Oh, and I was going to wonder. Carlos was talking of uh, of Miss um, uh, Zimmerman in Florida for the uh, forensic uh, ex audit examination, or right? For close examination, uh, what was that? Uh, Linda Zimmerman. I was wondering if he had uh, a city or state. I mean, um, pardon me, a city or location that uh, to possibly locate her for us people in Florida. Well, if he's got uh, maybe a way to contact her, maybe come back on and give it. Right. All right. But, you know, those deposit slips for the UCC, for uh, for, the, for uh, your deposit to the bank, a lot of them to the, to, uh, have in, you know, uh, my, not, not exactly micro print, but small print. In fact, that's the banks that you want to go to not ones that say under their own uh, rules or regulations do they do collections and deposits, but ones that say uh, collections and uh, uh, collections and deposits are in accordance with the Uniform Commercial Code or other applicable, you know, 
guidelines that you want that I would think that UCC to uh, for the backup, otherwise they'll make up their own little, uh, you know, rules for, for uh, and who knows, they might, they might say in there, uh, we don't we don't we don't have special collections, you know, or special deposits. Well, yeah, well, right, we're we're not public. outside the UCC, which is really public. Uh, we're not going under the UCC. We're going directly under our own private. So we're making a special deposit just on our own private agreement, our own private instructions, our our own private order. Right. Okay. So that you don't think that would help and be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope Keith gets on, and uh, maybe I there's a way to talk to him about this unlawful detainer. And if Carlos can come back with Linda Zimmerman, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, it was a great read uh, in the way you um, pinpointed the uh, in, in, in important sections in there. All right, Almighty Buck, keep and protect you all. I'll talk to you. Okay, Frank. Thank thanks. You. Everything. Anonymous, you're unmuted. You hear me all right? Hello, a little louder. How about now? Yeah, it's a little better, but you're still kind of low. How about there? There you go. <laughs> Kristen, I've got a, a, good, a good one here to ask. Um, dealing with uh, code compliance and uh, what uh, we may be able to do when uh, code compliance is uh, starting to come at you. They haven't done a document yet, but you know, that usually comes right after what they just did anyway. What's a good thing to do there, Christian? What would you do? Uh, uh, take the debt title that they give you and combine it with an asset title, an equitable asset title, and then uh, merge the two together and extinguish the debt. Okay. Where's Waldo? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, they, they send you a, a letter, you know, uh, telling you they want you to do this or that or this or you pay this or that. That right there would be the legal, right? At law, yes, right. Statutes and codes. Okay. The the letter more more than likely will have a figure, so that could be the debt title and the equitable. Yes, the, uh, that would be the debt title, and then what I would put on that would be the equitable title. Which is what would it be? Uh, it would be the uh, my signature with the trust account and the account number. The date and uh, it would look like a check form, and it would be a special deposit order. And I would use that as trust res, that whole thing, and send it back to them merged as a special deposit in a formation of a trust. Okay. Um, my signature and the trust account, which the trust account is our communist number, but do you add the reverse number on the back? No, not the uh, not the bond number on back to the card. No, you don't have to use that one. Okay. And then, of course, uh, you've got to word it to a special deposit order, and I, I suppose I can uh, refresh my memory with uh, some of your audios. Yeah, it's just like a check. Uh, you're going to make the check out to yourself. You're going to sign the check as a grantor. Then you're going to turn it over on the other side, say, and you're going to endorse it. And then you're going to have a special deposit to leave that blank. That's a bearer form instrument. And then send it back to them as merged, and that is the payment. And that's also the special deposit, the formation of the trust. Then you got to create the uh, right. record 
for the formation of the trust, and then if you had to enforce it, then you've got the the uh, equitable claim and the enforcement right under under uh, equity. Okay, and, and when you say make a check, you're talking about what? Yeah, I, what I say like look at a check and take the information that's on a check, and you're going to put it on the face of that instrument. Okay. And it, but it's, gonna, it's not called a check, it's called a special deposit order. Yeah, that's right, special deposit order. Then you're going to flip it over like on the back side, and then you're going to endorse it, and then you're going to put special deposit two, and then leave it, put, draw a line, and that line is blank. So that being blank, anybody who holds that instrument is holding payment. And then you want to send that all to them merged with the debt title, with the asset title, back as the formation of the trust with as the special deposit. Uh, and you're going to have an, an instruction with that also that tells them what to do. So you'd have intent, purpose, parties, specific res, and you'd have a method of formation by delivery by mail. And now you've got a formation of a trust if you created the records and can prove that. Down, down here, I would, I would, uh, I would think that they would just send it all back. They get dummies to man the uh, the asylum there, you know. Um, uh, don't always try. Don't know you'll try. You know, uh, the fellow last night, you know, he just received a letter from the bank saying that they, they don't accept this. They don't agree with this. But I don't care what the letter said. What did they do? They didn't send the deposit back. They're sitting there holding the deposit, the special deposit. And they are holding the liability of the special deposit according to the trust indenture. I don't care what the letter says. I'm thinking that, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I do this, but they're going to still drag me down there. And Well, you know, I don't, I don't expect these people to roll over and die and not do anything. In fact, I just the opposite. You know, I expect them to probably continue on doing what they're doing. And that's probably going to continue to happen until we finally teach these people that they can't do this any longer because when they do, they get beat up. And they're going to find out that equity is a different kind of uh, law form. And they they don't have what they think they have at law. They don't have it under equity. Yeah. And in under equity, they're going to lose. And when we get our wins on some major ones and break a few arms and legs along the way here as a Jericho, then maybe these people will say, hey, you know, uh, maybe we better do what this is all about and let's start coming clean because this is what it's all about. And now let's let's get the truth out in, you know, that's, that's the way it's going to have to be. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know if I could say this on the call, what Rice McLeod told me 15 years ago, but it wasn't good. And it, and it was sort of what he foresaw in the future. And uh, I... I, I I see it, you know, I see exactly what he said, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say it, so what? He says that it'll probably take blood to get back to what we're supposed to be. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly believe that because of the way the uh, delusion is going throughout the uh, people's minds. They're just totally deluded. Anyways, thanks, man. I, um, I'm just trying to, you know, do a little pre uh Preventive maintenance <laughs> on on my trust because I know these people and they are they used to wear these nice blue and khaki pants, uh, bluish shirt. Now they're dressed in black. They ride around in black cars. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a doggone rocket scientist to see that.
So they ought to put a couple red swastikas on here and there, and then some lightning bolts on their collars. You know, that's. Uh... Well, you're right about that. Yeah, I mean, that would probably wake more people up, but you know, they're sly, quick, and subtle. Well, when they start asking you for papers and stuff, uh, you know, where's your, where's your, where's your this and this? Let me see where your this and that and everything else. You know, let me see your papers, please. Well, that's what, that's what happened to me today. And and the um, I'll just call him Guy. The the guy couldn't get me on what he was called on, so he looked around to see if he could get me on something else, and so he gave me two warning shots. And I go and I look right in the face. I go, so you come over here for this, and uh, you know you can't get me on that. So you look for something else. I go, just what are you, man? I'm a retired police officer. I go retired. I go, what the heck are you doing here harassing me? My gosh, man. You know, they, they seem like uh, they can't get the, the young people to do their dirty work anymore. They have to get the idiots, you know, the idiots that, uh, idiots, I think they're called, and uh, to do the job. And uh, code compliance, man, I'm telling you, they already stole a 65 Mustang from me. Uh, I'm on their list. <laughs> and they they took that baby, and my son went running after that thing. The next day, they found it at this graveyard. It was already parted out. And let me tell you, man, down here, did, 65 did Mustangs. A bill? Did you send him a bill? Buddy, I had none of this information that we know today. They put me in jail for a time. I think I'm, <laughs> my gadget, <laughs> what happened? Sorry, man. I, I'm really sorry to, to mess up your call. That's, I, my phone dropped out of my hand. Anyway, I, I think I messed up enough with you. But anyway, you know, I went for, uh, to jail four times with the information I knew 15 years ago. And now, you know, I'm, you know, you get burned a little bit. You, you're slower to move. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, at least we can do is we can wake up our neighbors. Buddy, that's who did it to me. It was my neighbor. <laughs> 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 you know that hurricane that we got in the Gulf? Well, that son of a gun came to my house and busted a, a limb. And the thing is, that tree that it busted a limb from, it belongs to the city. CPS, utilities, AT&T, whomever. And I was slick enough to talk that guy to come down here hey, and, and, and tell him, hey, cut that two, two-ton two limb off my roof, will you? You know, I was real nice. Uh, I even offered him donuts. And you know what? The supervisor did it. Well, the lady next door, she didn't get that kind of service. So guess what? She punishes me. Unbelievable. And that's what we have ladies and gentlemen, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, you know, we we got nutsy neighbors, you know, nut, nut and a nugget, <laughs> but anyway, Kristen, thanks, and I'm going to, I'm going to be waiting for this uh, little first aid. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, another question, um, when, when you put in a land trust, a simple little land trust, should you record it? Uh, if it's real estate, there's certain things you have to record on a real estate, yes. What I'm thinking is this, Kristen, and, and um, you know, correct me, of course, when I'm wrong. But if I do the, the land trust, because I've been tweaking information that it was given to me from one of your eager callers, and uh, I was thinking, hey, this is the time to do it, and maybe they won't come over here and pop me again. But uh, I don't know. You know, we don't know until we try, right? Right. Yeah. Just, but it just depends whether or not you want to uh, do a public trust or a private trust. So, uh, here's something for everybody on the call. Just so, you know, 
This is what I learned from Rice McLeod, a very wise man. Uh, he taught me about house numbers. If you got a number on your house, that is carte blanche, carte blanche uh, authority for them to come in to your house. But if you keep it on the mailbox, if your mailbox is off your house, and say on the driveway, the number there, as long as the post office doesn't whine about it and they deliver and whatever, you know, I'm just saying that that doggone number gives them carte blanche access into your house. So that's one of the little deals that this guy tried to tag me with. I didn't want to let him know that I know because I guess he would have just written out the ticket right then and there. Instead, I'm just stalling for time, but that's what is, is very true for everybody on the call. Your numbers, they give them carte blanche access into your house. That's why they can bust the door down if they think you're spoon-feeding yourself baby food and you're, it's illegal or something. Yeah, well, they can do that because they, if they've done a survey, and the survey is recorded as a general deposit in the county, and what you want to do is you want to take that general deposit in the county and withdraw it and put it back into the private special. That's that's what I want to do. You know, hoping that that uh, little maneuver works, you know, because you know how people are, man. You know, it'll work in city of... California. Well, that changes the jurisdiction. That changes the venue. Well, the thing is, pulls it out of the private, or put it, uh, pulls it out of the public, puts it in the private. Well, that's that's what I want to do, Kristen. Uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to uh, do this correctly. I don't want to have to do it again, of course. And uh, if I did, I'd probably be dead by the time I did do it again. So I want to do it right. And you know, learning from you is just fantastic. I mean, this information you throw us is uh, its a godsend, really. Answers a lot of questions. But, you know, it, 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 we're just in the 11 o'clock hour, you know, and uh, a lot of people have to kind of grin and bear it as they learn this and maneuver themselves through the process. You know, they got to grin and bear it so more people wake up. If they do. Anyway, uh, Kristen, when when you were talking about getting it out of general, my thoughts were to, you know, pull out the number, put it as a U, UCC-1 notice, non-file, and withdraw it or own it, right? Own it and then a 3 to withdraw it and then do a 1 and a 3 again but this time putting it in a special and transfer it, <clears throat> right? Yeah, a 133. 133. 133. That's the key numbers for everybody, 133. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Man. I'll let it go for somebody else. Okay, all right. Thanks, Carlos. Nope. Close. We're only five states away, but you're close. It's Albert. What did I say? What did I say? Carlos. Did I say Carlos? Excuse me, Albert. Yes. It's okay, man. No, no problem. We I didn't realize have the same that. accent, right. you know. We know too many languages. <laughs> That's true. Anyway, thanks. Okay, next caller. Another anonymous. Okay, another anonymous. Anonymous, you're unmuted. Christian? Yeah. Oh, this is Rick, California. How you doing? Rick. All right. Hey. Good. Uh, I think a couple callers back here. Uh, meant, you mentioned you're doing Book 90 tonight, and you did Book 9 on deposits on CJS. Uh, I just want to confirm that, but somebody else sort of confirmed it. I, that was one of my questions. Yeah, we did 90 first, and then we went to uh, 9 a little bit there. Do you remember what the section of 90 was? Section on 90? Oh. 45 something or? 
It was section 421. 421. Okay, great. Thanks. Now, one, now, it's been so long since you read. <laughs> the, you're probably not going to remember this, but uh, I was trying to take some notes. And you meant there was one section you read about halfway through your reading, and it was you called it the mortgage E, and I thought you said a mortgage or. And uh, I could be wrong on that, but you were talking about the mortgage E. Um, does that ring? If it doesn't ring a bell, no problem. I'll get off the line. But that stuck to my head, and I was trying to write a bunch of stuff down and didn't get it quite mm, fast. You don't remember a little more than that, do you? Uh, it was just you were talking about the responsibilities, I think, of the mortgage E. And what went through my head was, the mortgagee would be, I would think, the lender. Um, but that's that's about all I can remember because I'm trying to scribble notes as fast as I can I can and so forth. But if you can't remember, that's okay. We'll just you know table it and I'll see if I can't. Where to trust property has been wrongfully used to discharge or has been invested in a mortgage, the city key trust is entitled in equity to enforce the security interest of the mortgagee. But he acquires no ownership or interest in the property beyond the security interest for the amount of the debt? Yeah, that sounds like it. Now, the mortgagee would be the lender? So we're talking about the enforcement to enforce the security interest of the mortgagee. To enforce the interest of the mortgagee. Yeah, the, the security interest of the mortgagee, okay. so the, like the bank. Right, okay. Just wanted to clarify that. All right, that, that's fine. Um, it, it was a great reading today, and yesterday's call was phenomenal. So I uh, appreciate all the hard work you're doing and uh, moving forward, slow but sure, but uh, getting things done. And I just want to say thanks again. Uh, appreciate that. Okay. Anything else? No, uh, that's it for now. I mean, I'm just trying to learn, and, and I'm impressed with how everybody's just doing things, and I'm looking forward to getting to that level myself. So, appreciate it. All right. Frank, you're unmuted. Yeah, I didn't not make a big thing of this, but uh, the original, you know, skull and crossbones, and uh, of course the uh, you know swast goes goes way back in history. But and besides the pirates using the skull and crossbones, but the British uh, were the actual ones to first use the epaulets and and all that uh, on their uniforms with the skull and crossbones. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of history. Now, sorry to uh, interrupt with anything not not as, as pertinent as uh, as anything else. So. Okay. Well. Good news to be used. Anything else? Um, just that, that section that you were just reading there about the mortgagee, because that was inter interesting what uh, I had written down in notes, too. That was that uh, 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 Book 90, Section 421? Was that uh, that section? I don't know what the section number was. Right. I'm sorry? The section was uh, four thirty seven in book ninety. Right. That was under mortgages. Yeah. Mortgages section four thirty seven. Under Book 90 of CJS. Right. Thank you. All right. I appreciate that much. Love you all. I'll let, I'll let somebody else get on there. Okay. Thanks, Frank. <clears throat> 619, you're unmuted. Uh, TW? Yeah. Um, before when you were leaving off those five principles, of those five things. I was writing stuff that you said before. Is there any way you could say those five things again? Uh, 
My name is so and so grantor beneficiary. Okay, I am, yeah. Uh, two, this hearing is contrary to equity. Contrary to equity. Three, trust is a special matter. Trust is a special matter. Uh, four, as there exists, quote, no adequate remedy at law. As there exists, no adequate remedy at law. And five, I invoke the private side of equity for relief. I invoke private side of equity for relief. And that relief versus uh, that remedy, where does that come into? That's, uh, that's how the corpus juris secundum, uh, remedy is at law and relief is in equity. Okay. Okay, thank you, Christian. All right. Okay, next caller, you're unmuted. Eric, you're unmuted. Oh, actually, it's Harold. Harold, hi. Hi, Harold. Oh. How you doing? Uh, quick note to add something to what Carlos was stating about the... Um, there, um, the judge trying to lift the stay, notwithstanding. Okay. You can immediately um, state on record, uh, if the judge does that, that you will appeal, do an interlocutory appeal, because you're dealing with a dispositive issue, and that will stop the lifting of the stay to allow for the appeal. So you can uh, declare that immediately upon that uh, order that you will appeal and that should keep the stay in place till you know, the I, determination of the appeal. That's kind of like an automatic stay on the stay, you mean? Yes, yes. Particularly based on the uh, the issues that you're, you're raising, why it should not be lifted, if they haven't adequately proved their claim uh, based on competent witness, excuse me, competent evidence under the federal rules, um, that that goes to the heart of standing. So that's dispositive, and that should get you an interlocutory appeal. Okay, that's good. So just, just something to throw in there on top of what he was saying. About how much time does that buy it, you know? Well, the uh, you know once you get the appeal uh, notice of appeal filed, and I I'm not sure of the timelines on the appeal, but it'll be uh, during the the entire process of the appeal. It basically stops whatever's been going on in the um, the lower court until what happened in the appellate court is is concluded, and then it resumes back if you lose. Or if you uh, you win the uh, the appeal with regards to the lifting of the stay, then everything down below resumes from that point forward. Okay. So just another tidbit to go on there to uh, to stop them in their tracks. More tools to have. Yep. Alrighty, that's it for me. All right, Harold. We appreciate it. Thank you. Carlos, you're back on. We're unmuted. Yes, I'm calling back with the, uh, what's his name, Frank? Wanted to Frank. find out the, uh, yes, it's Boca Raton. B -O Boca Raton. Yes. B-O-C-A-R-A-T-O-N. Mouth, no, mouth, mouse. Boca Raton. And also, on this question, he had about the, uh, about the land trust, if he would record it, he would be defeating the purpose of the land trust. If you're gonna publicly notify everybody that you are the beneficiary of the land trust, why form a land trust? Might as well leave everything alone. So the answer is no, you do not record anything 
Nothing at all, only the deed, the grand deed. That's all. Thank you. One more, Anonymous. You're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh-huh. Hi, Christian. And I uh, just had a question. Um, I think you spoke about it uh, several calls ago, but um, I was not on it. So what are your thoughts about um, go ahead and claiming um, the the trust of a deceased parent? Somebody who has already died and claiming yeah. that... You have three years, apparently, to claim it. Yeah, I think we had another fellow who's claiming his father's. Yeah, do you know about this much? Or? Uh, I don't know that the he has he's going to a certain attorney because some attorneys are specializing in that, and he's having the attorney make out the documents the way that they want to see them. So mm -hmm. you might want to check with uh, with an attorney that specializes in that field. That's some, about, attorneys, that's about, some attorneys yeah. would know about that? Yeah, because there was an attorney that was he was working with, yeah, that knew about it. Mm. Do you have access to his information or a particular fellow or what? Uh that was Mike and Mike and Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. Any way I could talk to that person? Any contact? No? Any phone number uh, or Yeah, I don't have a phone number for him. Uh if he's out there, he come on. So that's about it. Usually, all you know about it. Usually, he's on the Wednesday night call. That's usually when I see he comes on. Okay. Um, that's about what you know about it. Yeah, that's about. Uh, other than me treating it the same way we were treated here, which mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure whether that would be what they want to see. Mhm. Mm I had uh, found out to somebody else that the form uh, 289091 would would do it, mail to uh, one in Washington D.C. and three different places. So, do you know anything about that? No. No, I don't. No, I can't really say about that one. All right. All right. Then maybe I'll try to be on the Wednesday night call and see if that fellow would show up and see what he would share about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Well, it's one o'clock, so I think we'll call it a night. See you tomorrow on Wednesday at uh, 8 p.m. on the talk show number. And uh, everybody have a great evening. See you then. Good night. <laughs>